Identity, both personal and national identity, is a notoriously difficult and elusive topic. We all tell ourselves stories to justify our existence, to rationalize our behavior, and to embellish our past in order to look better in the present and project an even more glorious image of ourselves for the future. Nations do the same, except that they perform on a much larger stage than most of us do. Construction has been the operative term for quite some time now when it comes to national identity, as it does with regard to so many other aspects of social life, in the past as much as in the present. Ever since Benedict Anderson's famous book, Imagined Communities, was published in 1980, 1991, we have been talking about imagined communities. Yet scholars since have reminded us that communities are not just imagined, let alone constructed out of thin air. Most notably, they have sought to correct what they suggest has been, has been an overemphasis on the modern inventiveness, inventiveness of nations from above. Anthony Smith and other so-called ethno-symbolists more specifically have provided a corrective to the notion that everything pertaining to collective identities is just imagined by cautioning that there is a primordial ethnic element in most forms of nationalism. With Smith, most scholars of nationalism now accept that the construction of nations is largely a top-down process in which symbols and then their manipulation play an important role. Yet, they have also come to recognize collective identity they have also come to recognize collective identity formation as an interactive process, meaning that if we want to understand why national cultures are often so deeply and widely felt and can persist across generations, we have to factor in the weight of the past as perceived and felt by the masses. And a shared culture, or at least the perception of a shared culture, is generally acknowledged as a necessary ingredient of a common identity. Smith has used this, the term sacred ideology for this type of national feeling. Now, this is true for Iran as it is for any other nation. The question is how Iranians got there, how they acquired their sacred ideology. In what follows, I will develop some ideas about the nature of this process during the reign of the Safavids. The mythology that history over time inevitably dissolves into, eventually to emerge as nationalism, tends to have the notion of an unbroken cultural lineage at its core. The concept of eternal Iran Iran and Javidan is a good example of this. Modern Iranians look at their country as a natural entity, a realm extending from sea to shining sea, from the Caspian Sea to the Persian Gulf, endowed with a glorious history that stretches uninterruptedly from the Ecumenists to the Islamic Republic, or perhaps to the reign of the Pahlavis in the eyes of the secular-minded. To the extent that interruptions occurred, they came in the form of eruptions, invasions by foreign forces, keen to rob Iran of its wealth and bent on destroying its primordial identity. From Alexander and the Arabs to the Mongols and more recently the Western imperialists, beginning with the Portuguese and ending with the British and the Americans. Yet the country has overcome each and all of these invasions. It has suffered by rising each time, phoenix-like, by way of defeating and absorbing the invaders. This image of redemption through defeat goes to the heart of modern Iranian identity. Now, the Safavids are accorded a special role in this narrative as the dynasty that united Iran and revived its glory, embodied in the still existing magnificent urban layout of Esfahan, as the rulers who gave the country its particularism by adopting Twelver Shiism as their faith, and as the last sovereigns who stood, stood tall for Iran by proudly resisting the onslaught of foreigners, the Ottomans as much as the European proto-imperialists, such as the Portuguese, the English, and the Dutch. This is a soothing story, one ready-made for nationalist pride. There's also quite a bit of evidence for its role in a continuing saga. In an earlier iteration of the Idea of Iran series published as a book, Hugh Kennedy and C. Bosworth offer a compelling overview of the transmission of Iraniyat through the early Islamic centuries and beyond, leading to what Bosworth uh, calls a, quote, symbiosis of two cultural traditions, unquote. They point to the deep-rooted administrative and fiscal theories and practices combined with age-old motifs such as the cycle of justice that survived the seventh century invasion because these served as a template for the administratively challenged Arabs. Kennedy identifies a strong hereditary element in the notion of power among the Dekhans, the Zoroastrian elites from Iraq, which survived the imposition of Arab rule. Most importantly, he draws attention to the newly developed new Persian language, relatively easy to master, fluid, capacious, which emerged as a vehicle for the expression of culture. 
In some ways, all this culminated, did culminate in the Safavid period, which in the popular imagination hoarded the cultural capital that had accumulated over the centuries, preserving it as something strong enough to withstand the chaos of the 18th century and the onslaught of an alien culture that followed. Yet, however real or true, the putative identity that unfolds accompanying this trajectory is still reproductive, perceived from the modern vantage point by us moderns, whether Iranian or non-Iranian, who are obsessed about identity in ways that the Safavids manifestly were not. And it tell us, tells us little about the way the Safavids, or more precisely Iranians in the Safavid period, perceived themselves. Obstacles stand in the way of unearthing this self view in light of a relative paucity of surviving documents other than heavily propagandistic ones, including the scarce ego documents from the period, we can do no more than assemble approximate picture of the Safavid self-identification. The first thing I'd like to submit is that the Safavids are not that preoccupied with the question of identity and certainly not in the modern sense of the word, and that if they were, it doesn't figure prominently in their writings. To be sure, they hearken back to earlier times, including a mythical past. It is not for nothing that Shah Ismail named his sons after old Persian heroes. In this, they followed the long series of Iran-based dynasties that may have had a foggy idea about the distant past, yet were cognizant enough of it to hitch himself, themselves to it. Yet, that does not mean that the Safavids were engaged in a systematic and comprehensive search in the past to retrieve an authentic identity. That would be a modern a way of going about it. If the Safavid rulers and the per Persephone elites had an identity that they articulated self-consciously, it was, of course, religiously based. They saw themselves as the inheritors of the legacy of the Shi'i imams and sought to connect this legacy um, uh, to, to this legacy by forging a f fictitious genealogy, linking the last Sasanian monarch, Yazdegerd III, to Imam Hussein by way of a presumed marriage with the king's daughter, Shahrbanu. Safavid history, the way it comes to us in the court chronicles, thus is salvific, intimately connected to the cosmological order and its eschatology. Of course, a religiously grounded identity does not preclude a secular sense of self as the masters of an empire with worldly concerns in, in opposition to other empires near and far. Incidentally, this did not include a need for the Safavid authorities to position themselves in relation to Europe, the West, which in modern times became the touchstone for a collective sense of self, specter and ideal, invasive as well as seductive, both the object of admiration and suspicion, and in all cases irresistible. None of this existed in the Safavid period. One looks in vain for any references to Farang as a competitor, a threat, or a mirror. Indeed, other than in the Europeanizing painterly genre known as Farangi Sazi, Europe nowhere in the Safavid sources figures other than in an occasional and fleeting reference. Safavid identity, as it comes through in the court chronicles, is above, above all dynastic. The two faith and family are, of course, connected. The faith buttressed the dynasty by providing it with legitimacy, and the dynasty protected and bolstered the faith, especially against its Sunni foes surrounding the Safavid realm. Legitimacy and loyalty in the Chronicles centers on the Shah and his entourage, more than on the divine order in which he operates, and far more than on the land. This seems natural in conditions where administering a refractory, extremely diverse country with inherently fluid and fungible boundaries meant staying on top of a complex, perpetually competitive struggle with the other stakeholders in the enterprise, the chieftains of tribal clans and confederations. Even the clerical class followed this line of argumentation. Their writings couch the Safavid enterprise in religious terms as the embodiment and fulfillment of the divine order, but they invariably see the Shah and the dynasty he has as a necessary, indispensable pillar of the divine order and as a protector of the entire edifice. Of course, territory was important, if only as a source of taxable wealth. Landed property to be parceled out through prebends to use. So what about the land? What about Iran as territory? As is well known, the term Iran Shah and Iran Zamin disappeared from the sources or for a good half millennium following the Arab invasion to be revived by the Mongols, who famously united the two halves of classical Iran, the lands located west of the central deserts and the region of Greater Khorasan as it existed under the Sasanians. Once established in Iran Zamin, the Mongols also engaged in extensive patronage of Iran's patrimony with the Shah Nameh as its sinosure. The development of the new Persian language as a dominant cultural tongue in its vast territory assisted in this process. All this is well known. <clears throat> 
one does encounter the term Iran in the early Safavid sources. It takes over from classical terms as, such as Iraq Ajam for Western Iran, but it does not occur frequently, and that's already been mentioned, of course, today. Indeed, it is striking how little the chronicles refer to Iran as an overarching concept. The fourth and last volume of Khan Amir's Tariq Habib Asiyah, an important chronicle that serves as a connective tissue between the pre-Safavid between pre-Safavid and Safavid times, is a case in point. In its 700 pages, the way it's been published, the term Iran occurs seven times, once every 100 pages, twice in conjunction with Turan, Iran or Turan, uh, once as Padishah Iran to Turan, and once independently as Iran, and once as Mamalek Iran, and once again as Mamlakat Khorasan or Sayyid Mamalek Iran. A, simple, a similar picture emerges from, the six, from, another, uh, from other 16th century chronicles, such as the Asana Tavarikh and the Cholausata Tavarikh. In the former, the name Iran appears all of three times, and it occurs randomly, respectively, as Velayat Iran, Belad Iran, and Sultanat Iran. As reflected in the contemporary chronicles, which with Shah Abbas I, the notion of Iran as an integrated realm, having overcome its natural foes as much as its external as its internal foes as much as its external enemies becomes firmly established. Yet the term itself, Iran that is, still does not occur with great frequency in the written sources. The Tariqa Olam Araya Abbasi is interesting in this regard. The term Iran occurs only sporadically in this most important of all Safavid chronicles. When it does, it typically appears in conjunction with the Ottoman Empire and, and its aggression, especially the various attacks on Iran by Sultan Suleiman during the reign of Tahmas, beginning with the so-called War of the Two Iraqs of 1534 and the damage done to the country as a result is articulated in clear geographical terms. In one instance, describing the Ottoman assault on Tabriz, um, uh, uh, Ibrahim Beg um, uh, connects the uh, geography to the dynasty by referring to the steadfastness of the city's inhabitants who were devoted, quote unquote, to the Safavid house and performed valiant deeds on behalf of the Safavid dynasty, unquote. The other contemporary chronicles consulted by me are similar in this regard. In all, the term Iran as an overarching concept remains subdued, as assumed, implicit, rather than boldly present, presented in, an, say, an introductory chapter and throughout a text. One could argue, of course, that this very fact speaks to the supreme self-confidence among the Iranian elite, sure in the knowledge that their country was the envy of the world and its ruler the mightiest of, of all monarchs self-evidently sovereign. He who knows himself great doesn't have to shout it from the rooftops, in other words. For more, some ex more explicit manifestations of a sense of Iran yet, we have to turn away from the court chronicles, which of course are their own genre, have their own language and, 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 and paradigms, um, and move to uh, uh, other, other sources, written sources. For example, the urban, those generated by the urban Persephone 12 Rishi elite. Uh, and to look for the, the ways in which they identify themselves. Now, we have outside observers, let me begin with, that, with those, uh, who allude to a high, self degree, high degree of self-confidence among Iranians, uh, expressed in overblown notions about their country's size and importance, and I'll give you three. The French Capuchin father Poulet d'Armainville, who spent years in Iran in the 1660s, insisted that it was an Iranian habit not to see to foreigners in anything but to show that they knew best. Petros Bidik, an Assyrian Armenian who resided in the Safavid realm between 1670 and 75, referred to a similar self image when he stated, quote, they think that their people and their country surpass all other nations named above, and in accordance with the judgment of their astrologers, they call their territory the center of the world, unquote. The French Huguenot merchant traveler Jean Chardin in the same period claimed that Iranians were convinced that they possessed everything that was necessary in life or that might made life agreeable. Most people in Iran, he averred, thought that it was because their continent had so little to offer that Europeans swarmed out over the globe in search of the nice and necessary things that they themselves lacked. There is also a very interesting uh, sort of a, a, a snapshot from real life recorded by the Dutch and which conveys, to my mind, at least the same kind of self-view. It involves a series of tense encounters between Reinier Kazembrot, the director of the Dutch East India Company, and Safavid Grand Vizier Sheikh Ali Khan in 1681. 
The meetings which they had and the strained atmosphere in which they were conducted had their origins in a controversy over the terms of the silk contract that the VOC had signed with Shah Abbas in 1623. Kazembrot refused to abide by the obligation stipulated in that arrangement to purchase a fixed amount of silk from the Shah each year, citing current conditions they thought were contrary to its terms. Sheikh Ali Khan demurred, making it clear that the Dutch should simply abide by the clauses of the original contract. At one point during the discussions, Kazembrot pointed out that the VOC was important for Iran's economic well-being. He reminded the Grand Vizier that the Dutch trade in spices had enriched the country and that the activities of the company had, turned, had helped turn Bandar Abbas from a sleepy village fishing village into a thriving commercial port. Sheikh Ali Khan, highly irritated at what he considered insolent, presumptuous Dutch behavior, dismissively told his interlocutor that all that the VUC brought to Iran was worthless bark and leaves, referring to the costly spices such as cinnamon, cardamom, and nutmeg that formed the bulk of Dutch imports into Iran. The Iranians, he insisted, did not need any of this stuff. Kazembrot was mistaken to think that the Shah was an ordinary merchant. And if the Dutch didn't like the contract they had signed with Shah Abbas, they could pack up and leave. As these examples suggest, an idea of Iran was clearly present in the mind of the Safavid elite. But its constituent parts, the provinces, the regions that until today play such a key role in any individual Iranian sense of self also figure prominently, and in a way one could argue even more prominently in the written sources of the period. You know, you go back to the chronicles and they're filled with references to Iran's key regions, Azerbaijan, Khorasan, Fars. Quite explicitly, all these receive the bulk of attention in these chronicles. In, in fact, the chronicles are mostly about these provinces, the activities, the rebellions that take place, and yes, the Shah having to sort of subdue them, having to patrol and surveil his realm in order to keep all these places together. Um, so in other words, we are faced with a far more complex and layered and compounded type of identity in the simple degree to which people identified with Iran. So let me talk a little bit about that. Nor is this surprising, really, uh, courtesy of its forbidden physical environment, something that too few people pay attention to, I think, largely consisting of desolate deserts and formidable mountain ranges interspersed with scattered fertile, fertile oases. Iranian civilization has always been centered on its archipelago of urban centers. These were not just economically autonomous, each constituting a production and consumption center catering to and being supplied by its immediate hinterland, but also culturally and politically largely self-sufficient. And I'll give you now three examples from the Qajar period, not having been able to find any direct ones that are as, as interesting and as pointed uh, from the Safavid period, but they actually bring home the idea that this sort of regionalism and a lack of identification with a larger entity persisted far beyond the Safavids, because again, they're all three from the Qajar period. The people of Baluchistan, the British Telegraph employee Ernest Floyer observed in the 1870s, talked about Kerman the way the English peasant talked about London, as a far away, inaccessible, largely imaginary place. A Qajar official who visited Baluchistan a few years later in circa 1880 claimed that the people in that remote part of the country had no idea about the central government in Tehran and that some thought they were British subjects. <laughs> the French explorer Gabriel Bonvalot finally, traveling through Iran a decade later, met someone in Kurdistan who carried Russian paper money. Asked why he did not carry Iranian coinage, the man responded by saying that the Iranians were too stupid. When Beauvalon inquired if the man himself was not Iranian, he replied by saying, no, no, I am from Hamadan. <laughs> so now, how do we resolve this tension between pride in Iran as an idea, but a rather abstract idea, and over, as an overarching concept, as identified by foreigners and implicitly conveyed by the indigenous sources, on the one hand, and the intensely regional and local identification reflected in these three anecdotes, and we can adduce many more, uh, uh, much more evidence for that. Now, one way of rec to reconcile the two is to listen to Arthur Comte de Gobineau, a bit of an unlikely source, perhaps, in his observation about Iranian identity. Of course, writing, again, much later, mid-19th century. Gobineau is mostly known as the father of scientific racism, of course, and oftentimes simply dismissed on that count. But he also served as a consul in Iran in the 19th century, and he wrote very perceptively about the country and its people. Iranians... Gobineau submitted, loved their country very much. They forever sang the praises of Chak Iruni, 
considering it the most agreeable, fertile, and healthy of all. But having suffered through an endless series of oppressive regimes, their allegiance was to their culture rather than to their political leaders. Sounds familiar. Their real practical allegiance, in other words, was first and foremost with their towns and regions. Now, the pride and prejudice that one detects here is often concentric, working its way out of one particular city, one's own. Abdi Beg Shirazi, mid 16th century author of the chronicle Takmilat al Akbar, I think it's been mentioned today, in one of his poems sings the praises of his hometown, Qazvin, and calls it superior to any city anywhere, domestic and foreign, whether in Egypt, Syria, the Ottoman lands, or Iraq. An excellent example of the same kind of sensibility is found in the Tofi Kharafiq a recently edited Mirror of Princes type of work of advice and reflection on politics and morals dating from the 1680s. Muhammad Ali Khazvini, its author, calls his hometown Esfahan the city with the smartest people for being located in the second clime. And Iran is to the world what Isfahan is to Iran, the center of civilization. And I'll give you a quote. Paradisi paris paradisical, paradisical, what is the term? something you know, pertaining to paradise. Iran is, uh, 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 most of whose territory is, lo is situated in the fourth and the third and the second clime, and which extends from the Oxus River to the Ever River Euphrates, and from the Iron Gate, Darbant in the Caucasus, to the Sea of Oman, is the civilized center of the world and the summation of the cream of humanity, the virtues, the conditions, the intelligence and the profession of its inhabitants of its population, populated regions exceeds those of the inhabitants of other lands and regions by far. And anyone who looks into it will recognize that among those who have excelled or stood out in any of the rational and religious sciences and the arts, most are Iranians. Khazvini goes on to argue that since time immemorial, Iran has been known as a land of plenty, superior in its bravery to, of its people to Turkestan, wealthier than the Ottoman lands, and with a greater crop of outstanding artists and artisans than India with its rich tradition of arts and crafts. The Tawfiq al-Rafiq evinces a very strong sense of Iraniyat, in other words. Yet Iran remains still a, an idea rather than a realm with, a clearly, with clearly delineated parameters. For a full overview and celebration of that idea of Iran as a geographical unit, we have to wait for Muhammad Mufid Mustafi as Muhtasara Mufid, a rare geographical compendium from the late Safavid period. Mufid Mustafi established a cl clear cultural link with the past in his work. He narrates the story found in Ferdowsi Shahnameh, according to which the mythical King Feridun, sensing his approaching death, gives Iran Shah, the land between the Euphrates and the Oxus, the sinecure of the world's inhabitable, habitable quarter, the Robo Maskun, a vast land blessed by the divine, inhabited by learned and eloquent people, to his oldest, wisest, and worthiest son, Iraj. The term Iran only occurs sporadically in Mufid and Mufsofi's work, there too. When it does, however, it is mostly, and when it does, it mostly uh, is in juxtaposition with Turan and Hindustan, which is a bit of a trope. Uh, in, or in conditions of being assaulted and invaded by its enemies. Yet the contours of Iran are clear, as is the hierarchy in its constituent parts. Pride of place is given to Iraq, that is Iraq Arab, of course, ground zero of the Shi'i faith that animates and legitimizes the Safari polity. Iraq Ajam follows, emphasizing the centrality of Isfahan at the time. Regions further are described with an eye to their inclusion or inclusion, exclusion or inclusion. Greater Armenia, for example, falls within the boundaries of Iran, according to the author. In the section on Kich and Makran, you know, on the Gulf of Oman towards you know, Pakistan today, towards India, um, barren territory, uh, Mufid Mufsofi um, uh, evinces ambiguity. Uh, classical geographical sources, he reminds us, consider these barren uh, regions to be beyond Iran. Yet, he adds, its rulers currently pay the land tax, Kharaj, to Iran's authorities, and thus the region should be included, even if the people are Shafi'i Sunnis who hardly have any notion of the outside world. <laughs> Remarkably little space uh, finally is devoted to the Gam Sirat, the Persian Gulf Coast, which figures so prominently in the Western trade-based sources and in the modern Iranian imagination, but here comes last. In keeping with the conspicuous absence of any interest in the sea among pre-modern Iranians except as a source of danger, the Caspian Sea isn't even mentioned in the Mokhtasara uh, Mufid. Now, we have a, a few, uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes? 
Okay. So we have a few local chronicles from the Safi period, fortunately, uh, that allow us to test the extent to which local or regional affinities prevail to exist in juxtaposition to more expansive identification with Iran uh, as an overarching concept. The Safi Hat um, al-Irshad is a late Safi chronicle uh, depicting events in Kerman. And it's an excellent example of regional pride. At the outset of the account, Mu'amin Kermani, the author, offers a rather precise delineation of the region of Kerman, combining historical genealogy with geography. Kerman, he exists, insists, of olden times consisted of seven regions, Belat. This, he adds, goes back to the Sasanian monarch Ardashir, who first brought prosperity to Kerman. The region of Kerman, he continues in rather trope-like fashion, is a grand and vast land, Zamin wa Veloyat Azim Vasi, that stretches from the deserts of Sistan and Khorasan, from Sindh and Multan in the east, and the farthest reaches of Fars in the west. Towards the south, it extends all the way to Hormuz and Minab, on the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf, the Daryaya Oman, as he calls it. And in the north, it borders on the deserts of Khorasan, Yaz, and Abarku. No other territory of such expansiveness exists anywhere else, according to the author. Now, what do we conclude from all of this, from this overview? Well, a couple of things is in, to my mind. The Safavids managed to weld a disparate realm together by bringing the two halves, traditional halves of Iran, traditional Iran together in a process that arguably, and by consensus almost, uh, culminated with Shah Abbas, who stood tall against Iran's external enemies while reducing the autonomy of peripheral regions such as the Caspian provinces and the Persian Gulf Coast. These have been mentioned. Ideologically and rhetorically, the Safavid project was and remained animated and legitimized by religion, of course. The Shah's mandate was to be the protector of the realm, the enforcer of God's will, and the executive officer of the 12th Imam, so to speak. Yet the bulk of attention in the written sources goes to the dynasty, suggesting that the will to power was secular in its makeup. Religious power cannot exist without worldly power, whereas worldly power can exist, though perhaps not thrive and perpetuate itself, without being sanctioned by faith. Iran, Iran in other words, is mostly a dynastic enterprise. Um, it is there all the time, but it seems too obviously a terrain of action to be mentioned with a great fre frequency. That is, I think, is one conclusion would could, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a negative one, but I think it's, ar it's arguable to say that. It is telling in this context that neither of the two main Safavid manuals of statecraft, the Taskerat al-Muluk and the Dastur al-Muluk, both of which are written at the very end of the dynasty's reign to inform the Afghans pretty much of how to rule Iran, mentions the name Iran in this introduction, or otherwise refers to it as, as part of the polity, uh, of the polity that it purports to identify and, and inventory. The former, that is the Taskerat al-Muluk, uh, lacks any geographical specificity and refers to the exalted court, Dargah Mu'ala, and the Safavid king, Salatin al-Safavieh. The latter uses the term Mamolik and Mahruseh, which is also a term that occurs occasionally, but by no means with great frequency in the sources the protected realm. Yet Iran did live, live in people's hearts. I think that is also very true. With pride and prejudice, a notion culturally rather than geographically defined, entwined with a very strong local and regional sense of identity that was an inevitable outcome of Iran's centrifugal tendencies. By unifying Iran, the Safavids by no means ended the country's regional particularisms. Iran remained a country with as many centripetal tendencies as centrifugal ones, a land of unity with diver within diversity. It's, of course, a cliche, but it's, it's very true for Iran, as is demonstrated by the flux and reflux of its dynasties, as well as the fact that the capital continued to move around until the early 19th century. Now, towards the end of the period, the Safavids had managed to construct a nucleus of a national identity, one that operates in concentric circles, with urbanites looking at their town and regions as the best, the most fertile, the most proper, prosperous, and looking at Iran sort of abstractly, if you will, as the collective reservoir and culmination of all this cultural capital. Now, the embodiment, I think, and, and the culmination really is the Mukhtasar uh, Mufid, the, the only real geographical manual that we have, which represents a rather mature and sophisticated sense of Iran, yet specific and precise in its geographical classification. Yet the Muhtasara Mufid remains singular, heir to a medieval tradition of Mamolekum Masaolik literature, so the traditional geographical literature 
you know, describing towns and regions, uh, but certainly unique for the uh, Safavid period. It did not generate an urge to explore Iran and its constituent parts in any depth. Um, Mustafi, uh, Mufid Mustafi also wrote from exile, very important, from India, looking back on what he had lost, Iran. A sense of nostalgia suffuses the work. This sense of loss, of fate making its claims of decay and decline, emerges even more clearly from the works of Hazin al Lahijani. Hazin al Lahijani, traveler and polymath who escaped the turmoil accompanying the fall of the Safavids in 1722 by escaping to India. By the time Lahijani lived and wrote in 1730s and 40s, the idea of Iran was receding into an idealized past, overtaking by the chaotic present. Hazin, having moved to India and acknowledging the mistake he had made doing so, looked back on Iran with a great deal of nostalgia, pining for his homeland from the swampy, fetid place he found India to be. He called Iran Zamin, the elevated paradise. It expands wider than Solomon's realm and its majesty better than the gem on his ring. Iran's identity uh, finally remained culturally rather than politically and territorially grounded for another two centuries. A real concern about territory as an integral part of Iraniyat with clearly defined and delineated boundaries arguably only emerged in the early 19th century, most notably following the humiliating defeats, series of defeats at the hands of the Russians. And it would take another century and the constitutional revolution before the idea of Iran as a community defined by common borders as an assembly not of subjects, but of citizens tied together by civic rights and responsibilities would gain ground. Thank you very much. In today's talk, I want to take up uh, some of the, the threads that have been uh, left uh, by many of the talks that we've already heard today. Uh, for instance, uh, Ali Anushar uh, left us uh, at the end of his talk uh, with a sort of a very tantalizing uh, uh, articulation of political theology, the way in which the body of the Safavid Shah came to be identified with the kingdom. And so uh, it, it's... Um, in identifying how the various strains of uh, political theology, whether they were Neoplatonic in their origin, whether they're old Iranian or occultist or Shi'i or Sufi, uh, whatever, uh, were combined by theorists to articulate uh, the king's relationship to his land, to his subjects, uh, and to the broader world around him that I'd like to uh, begin my talk today. Um, the period about which I'll be speaking is one that's typically characterized um, uh, by vastly uh, contrasting forms of rule uh, in the various parts of the uh, Islamic world. Uh, just to give a, a few examples, uh, we've already heard from Colin uh, about Shah Abbas's uh, so-called sovereignty showcase purge as Shah Abbas uh, attempted to consolidate power uh, in the sort of aftermath of the uh, Safavid, uh, really, civil war, uh, very famous uh, for executing um, and purging uh, forms of relig religious heterodoxy uh, that were found uh, throughout the kingdom in an effort to uh, really solidify a kind of uh, uh, orthodox 12-er Shi'i um, basis uh, to his reign. Meanwhile, uh, to the east, uh, in India, uh, Ak uh, Shah Abbas's uh, contemporary, at least for the beginning of his rule, Akbar uh, is portrayed uh, as having instituted a period of, of social harmony and tolerance in which the various subjects of the realm, be they Muslim, Hindu, Zoroastrian, Jain, or, uh, or others, uh, were able to cooperate in such a way that notice was even taken by European observers of the Mughal court uh, very famously, uh, Sir Thomas Rowe, uh, the ambassador to the court of Jahangir, uh, in a speech to British Parliament, actually praised the ability of the various uh, classes of Indians uh, to work together um, as being something which is good for business and which perhaps the British might adopt uh, in, uh, in, in relating to uh, foreign labor uh, in the British Isles. Um, it's, of course, a problem that's still with us. Uh, uh, Akbar is, uh, you know, uh, famous for instituting uh, what, in popular historiography, is referred to as the Dine Elahi, uh, or the the divine uh, religion, which is premised on a notion uh, referred to as Solhe Kol, universal harmony. And it's this idea that I really want to take up in my talk. 
Surprisingly, as I began to investigate the, the sort of history of this idea of sulfai kol, I found uh, that the term actually uh, developed uh, initially within the Safavid realm, uh, used uh, primarily uh, to describe uh, spiritual exercises associated uh, with uh, mystics uh, in mid-century uh, Shiraz. Uh, these exercises were based on a theory of macrocosm whereby practices relating to the human body, the body politic, and the celestial bodies were seen as closely interrelated to one another. Balancing the interests of members of diverse social and religious communities was seen to promote social harmony in the same way that dietary practices, specifically vegetarianism, produced a harmony of bodily humors, and that theurgical practices of planetary veneration promoted the harmony of the heavenly spheres. While at the beginning of the 16th century, such ideas were particularly associated with the city of Shiraz in Safavid Iran, by the end of the century, many of the mystics associated with the idea of Solhe Kol had been patronized by the Mughal Emperor Akbar, who crafted Solhe Kol into one of the bases of his royal legitimacy. And yet, in spite of the consolidation of 12 Rashi orthodoxy and the eclipse of Sufism and Safavid Iran, uh, the idea of Sulhe Kol uh, continued to be invoked by Iranian thinkers well into the late Safavid period and beyond. And so in today's paper, really what I'm going to try to do is to understand the rise and fall of Sulhe Kol to better understand the contested nature of kingship and specifically Iranian kingship in the way that it's described uh, within Safavid Iran. Um, so in the first part of today's paper, I would like briefly to outline the connections drawn between bodily health, social welfare, and celestial harmony as they were understood by authors, uh, primarily writing, I guess, within something we would broadly identify as philosophy or specifically ethical philosophy, ethical literature, akhlaq literature, uh, in the years surrounding the, Saf the rise of the Safavid dynasty. As I proceed, I'll examine how techniques to further the harmony of the body, society, and the cosmos were incorporated into the spiritual exercises of a particular uh, occultist, sort of quasi-Sufi group, uh, the, uh, Oz, the followers of a man called Azar Kevan, or the Azariye, um, who, uh, Azar Kevan, who famously uh, claimed to be uh, reviving the ancient practice of the ancient Iranian kings, and indeed uh, to, to be initiating a new Persian dispensation at the moment of the Islamic millennium. Well, Azar Kevan began his career in Shiraz under the reign of Tahmasp and attracted followers from the so-called school of Shiraz. Like many of his contemporaries, Azar Kevan emigrated to India by the late 16th century. And finally, in the third part of this paper, I will briefly examine a little bit of the correspondence between the Mughal Emperor Akbar and the newly crowned Safavid King Abbas to trace the complex role that the rhetoric of Sulhe Kol played in Safavid and Mughal understandings of kingship. In the letters of Abbas to Akbar, we can see uh, really one of the first uh, instances of an Iranian rejection of the notion of Sulhe Kol, universal harmony, uh, and, an and an articulation of an alternative form of Persian Persian kingship, uh, one which, in uh, Abbas's view, perhaps more compatible with 12 Shiism. Finally, uh, if I have time, and I don't think I will, uh, the paper will uh, conclude with a brief survey of Sulhe Kol in the later history of the Safavid dynasty. Which brings me to the first part of today's talk. Um, the theory of macrocosm, the idea that the human body, the world, and the universe are interconnected and directly correspond to one another, was widely accepted in the medieval Islamic world. With its origins in Stoic and Pythagorean thought, the theory of macrocosm had particular importance for the development of ethics. Uh, the Akhlaq in Nasiri, uh, composed by Nasiruddin Tusi, whom we've already been speaking about, on the eve of the Mongol sack of Baghdad, had already compared the social ills of the world to the ailments of the human body. The role of the ideal king as the regulator modaber of the world is thus akin to that of a physician. In the years surrounding the rise of the Safavid dynasty, a great deal of ethical literature derived from Tusi was composed in Iran. The leading Shirazi scholar of his day, Jalaluddin Davoni, uh, who died in 1502, the same year that uh, the Safavid uh, Esmail I declared himself Shah, uh, dedicated his Akhlaq Jalali uh, to the Aqayunlu Sultan, uh, one of the la last great monarchs of, of pre Safavid Iran. Expanding on Thusi's notion of the just ruler as physician, Davoni writes that the king is the physician of the world. 
Just as there is no choice for the physician but to know about sickness, the causes of pain, and the methods of cure, likewise it is necessary for the sultan to know the sickness of the kingdom and the means of its cure. Since the term civilization, tamadon, is given to a general assembly of different peoples, then as long as every one of those peoples sticks to its own position and remains in the task assigned to it and receives the share of riches and honors, a station and property which are appropriate to them, then the temperament of the civilization is in a state of equilibrium at the dal, uh, and its affairs are at the pinnacle of organization. For it is established that the source of every state is the consensus of a population who, in their cooperation, resemble the organs of a single body. In this manner, it is as though they are a single person whose collective power is greater than that of the population. Just as Muslim physicians, as heirs of the uh, tradition of Galen, uh, understood illness to be caused by the disproportion of bodily humors and temperaments, uh, likewise, for ethical thinkers like Davoni, social illnesses are caused by imbalance, by a lack of et tadal. It is the duty of the king to promote an ideal, balanced, harmonious state. And despite the fact that society is comprised of diverse populations, it is the king's job to promote equilibrium uh, and to harmoniously adjust for uh, these differences so that different classes of society might serve one another just as the organs of a body do. For Davani, then, the ideal state functions as a united single body politic whose combined power is greater than the sum of its parts and at whose top stands the king. Bodily harmony parallels at the macrocosmic level the notion of the harmony of the heavenly spheres, tanasub aflok. Just as Ibn Arabi had com compared the universe to a great man, uh, to al insan al kabir, uh, mystics of Safavid time similarly saw the entirety of the universe as a human body. Thus, for instance, the 16th century Dasotir Osmani. Uh, regarded as the sacred texts of the Azar Kevani mystics, whom I'll be speaking about at greater length in a moment, uh, describes the universe as follows. The universe is the great man. When you examine a world as beautiful as this, I should point out that this text is, is composed um, originally uh, in, in a sort of constructed and a made up language and then uh, translated into pure Persian, that is Persian with no Arabic words. And so if the translation sounds a bit turgid, it's because the language is weird. Um, but uh, when you examine a world as beautiful as this, know that it is but a servant of his. Uh, if you look at it with open eyes and heart, you realize that the firmament is the skin of the great man, Saturn is his spleen, Jupiter his liver, Mars his gallbladder, it's on his heart, Venus his stomach, Mercury his brain, the moon his lungs, and the planetary mansions his veins and nerves. Living beings are the worms in his belly. So. He possesses a soul comprised of the souls of terrestrial and ethereal souls um, and a wisdom comprised of the consciousness of the inferior and superior beings. Thus, man ought not to be content with being a mere belly worm, uh, but strive to become part of the universal soul. The archetype for the human body in microcosm and society in mesocosm is therefore the harmonious universal macrocosm. The duty of mystics, uh, and also by extension the duty of, 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 of sovereigns, um, is to reject their inconsequential roles, individual roles in the universe, and instead to realize their essential unity with the macrocosm. Philosophers of the Safavid period saw ethics as a universal science. The ideal lawgiver, Sohab bin Amus, regulates the world through the application of universal regulations, Kavonina Kholi. Such regulations made no distinction, uh, at least in ethical texts, between Muslim and non-Muslim. Indeed, as the early Safavid philosopher and occultist Qiyasuddin Mansur Dashtaki writes, the principles of ethics unfold from the universal idea of the original source, the Mabdat. Uh, for Dashtaki, sages of every religion and in every age are united in their investigation of the original source. He writes, thus there have been different peoples and opposing nations in every age and every era of every single religion, yet no sage has ever recorded opposition to the existence of the original source. On the contrary, the impossibility of its contradiction is precisely its state and its quality. Love pervades universally and its rule extends over all. The beginning proceeds from him that is God and the end is him since everything is him. Just as divine love is universal since the entirety of existence is in fact God, here, of course, uh, developing uh, the notion of wahdat uh, al-wujud. The ethical principles which Dashtaki outlines are similarly universal. 
Thus, briefly to review so far, writings on ethics of the early Safavid period offer a theory of direct correspondence between body, society, and the universe. The ideal state for each of these was a state of equilibrium, harmony. Uh, in the case of the body, a harmony of bodily humors and temperaments. In the case of society, a harmony of the interests of different classes of individuals. And in the case of the universe, a harmony of proportions which characterizes the orbital motions of the spheres. Moreover, early Safavid philosophers argued that such principles were universal, shared by ancients and by moderns, by non-Muslims and by Muslims. So I'd like now uh, for a moment uh, to move away from the realm of philosophy to, to discuss how the theory of macrocosm and harmony uh, were taken up by mystics in the early Safavid period. To do that, I'm going to focus on a mystic and occultist uh, whose career and legacy forms the core of the book project that I'm working on right now, um, a man called Azar Kevan, uh, who was born into the complex religious topography of the early Safavid period. Groups we today identify as Imami Shis, Harufis, Noktavis, Nur Bakhshis, and uh, really a, a vast number of, of uh, undifferentiated messianic forms of Sufism appear to have been competing for legitimacy and political capital in the nascent empire, some with better success than others. We know very little about the details of Azar Kevan's life, but what we can ascertain comes primarily from books associated with his followers. Kevan is uh, said to have been born in the ancient capital of the early Sasanians, the city of Istakhr, in 1533, which you can see here on my map. He attracted a school of followers in mid-century Shiraz. According to the sources, many of them were classmates, uh, perhaps at the Mansuriya school uh, in the city. In Shiraz, Azar Kevan composed a visionary treatise uh, narrating an ascension through the heavens. Um, after refusing a series of invitations from the Mughal Emperor Akbar to take up employment at the Mughal court, Kevan eventually left Iran during the chaos of the Safavid interregnum traveling from Shiraz via Zabolistan and Bukhara, the capital of the Sheban and Uzbeks, to Lahore. He died in Patna at the age of 85, Patna in, in, north, in Bihar, in northern India, uh, in 1618. He was an ascetic, a vegetarian, a man who reportedly began to engage in fasting and staying awake for lengthy periods of time at the age of five. I have a four-year-old who stays awake for lengthy periods of time, but she doesn't fast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was, uh, so, so no chance of her becoming uh, a great Sufi sheikh, I'd think, but uh, uh, he was reportedly able to reduce the amount of food that he ate to the weight of a single dirham uh, per day. That's not very much food. Uh, and uh, according to the hagiographies, he lived in an earthen vat for a period of 28 years, um, apparently mimicking the, the practice of, of the Stoic philosopher Diogenes. Um, like the term etadol in ethical literature within the literature associated with Azar Kevan, the term sol operates at microcosmic, mesocosmic, and macrocosmic levels. That is to say, within the body of the saint, in his actions towards diverse members of society, and in his practices of theurgy, the worship of the, or the veneration of the celestial spheres. Azar Kevan's followers describe the state of sol bahame, or universal harmony, uh, to be a state achieved through a series of spiritual exercises related to dietary practice, social comportment, and the worship of the planets. The acquisition of sol bahame for the Kevani saint is a necessary step to allow a saint to achieve his ultimate goal, uh, that is to apprehend truly the divine unity, ta'aloh, or perhaps we might use uh, the neoplatonic term henosis to translate this. I think I'm following Sajjad in this practice. Um, um, now, Kevani spiritual exercises are patterned on Azar Kevan's own experience of uh, spiritual perfection, which he uh, recorded in a verse narrative entitled the Mokashafat Kevani, or the Revelations of Kevan. In the text, which um, must have been composed during the 1560s or perhaps early 1570s, Kevan narrates his visions of celestial spheres and ultimately his apprehension of existential unity. He writes, first I prepared my body and adorned it according to the physician's creed, Kishe Pezeshki. I abandoned my former religion, all my desires for rites and doctrines. Then I ceased to speak, neither good nor ill did I speak to anyone. In a dark and narrow place I sat and abided, I, abided. I lessened my food, ceased to sleep, I proceeded exhausted. Never did I rest from God's memory. Besides him, my misfortune seemed all the same. Here we see how micro, meso, and ultimately macrocosmic harmony operate at the level of spiritual exercise. The passage describes Kevan preparing his body according to the physician's creed, which is kind of an interesting expression. Uh, furthermore, he adjusts his diet and practices wakefulness. He abandons any form of religious partisanship, indeed speech itself. 
um, such, such bodily and societal practices thus prepare him to ascend through the celestial spheres and ultimately to the divine presence. Extant commentaries on the Mokasha Foth explain the text as follows. Uh, the traveler of the path must know the art of medicine so that he can bring whatever humors are dominant into harmony. Afterward, he must banish all beliefs of religion, customs, doctrines, and paths from himself. He must act in harmony uh, with all, must sit in a narrow and dark place and eat less by degrees. Here then, the harmonization of the four bodily humors, esloh echlot, is directly linked to the practice of civil harmony, sulh bahamet. Thus, bodily practice is the key through which to remove sectarian belief. For the Kaivanis, this practice entailed fasting, long periods of silence, particular breathing practices, and vegetarianism. Practices of vegetarianism amongst Iranian occultists were apparently widespread in the 16th century and often enjoined as prerequisites for the manipula manipulation of the planetary spirits for performing um, operations of astral magic, for instance. Uh, for the followers of Kaivan, the way to cultivate the harmony of spheres was to venerate them in their proper manner. The text of the Azar Kaivani uh, scripture, I suppose you would call it, the Dasatir contains individual liturgies uh, dedicated to each of the seven planets, uh, and some details surrounding the correct ritual performance of these literatures um, is provided in, in various texts associated with the schools. In fact, much of the extant Azari literature is comprised of hymns uh, dedicated to praise of the planets, uh, which themselves are, in fact, uh, Persian translations of the theurgical invocations of uh, the 12th century philosopher Shahabuddin Sohravardi, uh, as found in his Kitabu Warda to Taktisat. Uh, but indeed, recently discovered extant manuscripts of Azar Kavan's followers show that they collected planetary hymns in a variety of languages, not just uh, in, in the, their sort of pure Persian, but also in Avestan and Arabic and, and Turkish and Sanskrit and Hindi uh, for use in their celestial exercise. And, and this is because they, they, they held the idea that uh, the esoteric practice of all religions of the world uh, was essentially uh, to, to venerate the planets. In highlighting the universality of religion, uh, Kevan uh, likened all the religions of the world to the branches of a single tree uh, whose roots are one and whose fruits all taste the same. Okay, so here are some pictures of what the planetary idols look like in, in all the Kevani manuscripts. I'll just flip through those. They're, they're weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Uh, thus far, we've discussed Azari practices pertaining to the microcosm of the body, the macrocosm of the universe. Yet the Azari texts are also replete with discussions of social comportment. Uh, in 1610, a follower of Azar Kevan named Bahram ibn Farhad, who had studied in Shiraz before he began to follow Azar Kevan, completed a lengthy work, uh, which is sometimes called Sharistan e Char Chaman, uh, which he himself seems to have called the Sharistan e Danesh or Gulistan e Binesh the region of knowledge and the garden of vision. It's a text which intermingles a retelling of the history of ancient Iran. And the word Iran is actually used in this text all the time, probably, uh, I mean, uh, probably uh, in, in hundreds of times, actually, uh, with an account. So it intermingles the history of ancient Iran with an account of, of Azar Kevan and his followers, as well as the opinions of contemporary philosophers. Bahram records that Kevan, quote, used to say that the Sufi believes that one must not be partisan and that one should act alike with fellow travelers of different kinds. Just as one spends time with Muslims, one should also befriend Hindus, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Christians. Therefore, one cannot act according to the decrees of the jurists of the age, for they are perpetrators of jihad and murder, and thereby, thereby oppose what is, in fact, obligatory. Now, as state support of 12 Shi'i orthodoxy began to eclipse the forms of religious heterodoxy that had marked the early Safavid period, Interested parties from outside Iran, including the Shaybanids in Uzbekistan, the Mughals uh, in North India, and the Adil Shahis in the Deccan, uh, began to entice Iranian mystics like Azar Kevan to emigrate and to play a role in crafting their own ideals of sovereignty. From the surviving correspondence of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, as well as from contemporary Safavid histories, we know, for instance, that Akbar frequently corresponded with heterodox Iranian thinkers. In one letter to the Noktavi Ahmed Akashi, who was later executed by Shah Abbas for heresy, Akbar writes, quote, that the love for the people of Iran is deeply embedded in his heart. Uh, and he invites Ahmed to come to India to enjoy the imperial presence. Apparently, Ahmed should have done that, uh, but he didn't. Sorry. And 
Uh, likewise, several Azeri sources relate anecdotes about contacts between Kayvon and the court of Akbar, specifically with regard to Kayvon's ideas about planetary veneration. Thus, the Sharastan tells us, quote, we know the account of Sheikh Abul Faz uh, because he requested uh, a reference manual, a Destur al-Amal from Azar Kayvon, the Lord of the Sciences, uh, about the worship of the stars and the like. And then when the friend of the divine religion here, Dus Kama Yazdani Kish, Yazdani Kish is a Persian translation of Dine Alahi, obviously. Um, Azar Kevan came to India, uh, and uh, Sheikh Fezi and Abul Faz, that is the, the sort of prime uh, uh, viziers of, of the court of Akbar, learned from him the right of worshipping the sun and the other planets. So it seems likely then that the stream of migrants uh, from Shiraz to India, men like Azar Kevan uh, and others, played an important role in the Mughal Emperor Akbar's 1583 decree, instituting the Dine Elahi and the uh, adoption of Solhekol. So, thus far to review before I come to the last part of my talk. Uh, for the followers of Azar Kevan, the notion of Soh Bahame comprised spiritual exercises which operated at the micro, meso, and macrocosmic level. Through dietary practice, the humors of the saintly body were brought into harmony. Through equitable comportment with members of diverse religious communities, the saint removed partisanship and promoted social harmony. And through planetary worship and theurgical pra practices, the saint reinforced the harmony of the celestial spheres. This brings me to the final part of my talk. Prior to the rise of Shah Abbas, Safavid Iran was in the midst of a virtual civil war as contending factions among the religiously heterodox Ghazalbash tribes who had previously provided the military support of the Safavid state. Sorry, I just use the word tribes. I even have it scratched out of my, in my paper, but I still read it. Um, um, heterodox Ghazalbash. Comma, who had previously provided the military support of the Safavid state, uh, vied for uh, influence at the court of, the, of Muhammad Khodobande. With the accession of Khodobande's young son, Abbas, uh, to the throne in 1588, Abbas began systematically to stamp out the bases of Ghazalbash support. Famously, in 1592 um, and 1593, Abbas campaigned against the widespread Noktavi movement, gruesomely putting many of its leaders to death. A year later, the Mughal Emperor Akbar, uh, who was sympathetic to the Noktavis, wrote a letter to Abbas to chide him for the massacre, among other things. Um, indeed, uh, Akbar himself was secretly accused of the Noktavi heresy by his, court, uh, his courtier, Abdul Qadir uh, Badawni. In his letter to Abbas, uh, Akbar writes, today, quote, when the land of Iran is quite depleted of sages who look to the future, it behooves the man who is the quintessence of his noble ancestors to strive greatly to manage the kingdom and to cure the affairs of all mankind. In putting men to death and in destroying such divine structure, he must exercise complete caution. The sections of humanity, which are the wonders of the deposit to the divine treasury, must be regarded with the eye of compassion, and you must strive to unite their hearts. Realizing that the all-encompassing divine mercy comprises all nations and sects, you must strive as completely as possible to bring yourself into the eternal spring garden of universal harmony. In this short passage, which is drawn from a lengthy letter, we can see how many of the familiar elements from the ethical literature that I outlined at the beginning of this talk uh, appear. The first sentence in this quotation likens the role of the king to that of a, physi of, of a physician who is uh, providing a, a cure and el om to the affairs of mankind. The role of the king is to unite the hearts of the diverse sections of humanity. Divine love and mercy are universal, reach all sects and nations. Thus, Akbar's enjoyment of universal harmony is very much in keeping with the ethical notions of the duty of kings as they were understood by philosophers. Uh, while Akbar's letter to Shah Abbas has been well known to historians since the 19th century, Shah Abbas's response, or actually responses to it, are considerably less well known. The years immediately following the Noktavi executions of 1593 were a period of, of great activity, indeed great success for the Safavids. Abbas transformed the Safavid army, uh, and in 1598 sent his newly reformed army uh, uh, in a campaign against the Uzbeks, uh, su successfully retaking Khorasan. In the same year, the royal capital shifted from Ghazvin uh, to the more central Esfahan, where Abbas embarked on, of course, ambitious architectural programs. So perhaps emboldened by his success, uh, Abbas chose to send a delegation to the court of Akbar in the same year. In the preparation for the delegation, Shah Abbas commissioned a draft of a letter in which he would finally respond to Akbar's chastisement and his invitation to practice Zohar Kol. And the draft, which is unpublished, but which exists in at least two copies in London and Tehran, uh, Abbas boasts that his campaign against the Uzbeks will continue until the names of the 12 Imams are minted on the coins of Bukhara, and uh, the ritual cursing of the first three caliphs is uttered in every sermon in the Uzbek realm. Uh, 
Abbas then lambasts the, notion, uh, the notions of erfan, gnosis, and universal harmony as being incompatible with religious law, mashab. Writing, quote, several inquiries were, ma were made regarding religion and sect with those of crooked conviction and turbid morality. Although gnosis and universal harmony have little compatibility with religious law, mashab, or perhaps just religion, even still, as has been confirmed in heavenly scriptures and well-attested reports, every single one of the prophets and possessors of divine resolve has commanded uh, in endless injunctions that one should wage war against the damned, the Ashkio, and here, this obviously is a term with a lot of uh, Shi'i resonance. You, the good followers of the assembly of the Lord of the nation, will be happy and forgiven by men of reason if you take up such a cause. And then very curiously, the text uh, uh, moves into Arabic and says, rulership and religion are twins. If it were not so, then the most beneficial security would not exist, no doubt about it. The conduct of the king is in strengthening the religion as both the ancients and the moderns say. So instead of resting the justification of his rule on the notion of the duty of the king to promote harmony, here Abbas in, instead adduces another aspect of kingly rule that we as scholars might identify as quote unquote Iranian. Right? Here he is quoting uh, in Arabic from the so-called Testament of Ardashir, uh, a text ascribed to the first of the Sasanian rulers uh, in, in, in claiming that rulership and religion uh, are twins. And it is therefore the duty of the king to strengthen religion. Uh, the text then goes on to provide a quotation from the Shahnameh from the, from the section on Ardashir Quote, be the protector of religion and of wisdom if you don't want your days to go badly. Religion is in its place in the royal throne. Without religion, rule is unsound. They are each other's sentinels as though they lie between, beneath a single tent. Here, uh, as I move to my conclusion, it's interesting to compare Abbas's invocation of the Shahnameh with Shahnameh manuscripts that were prepared for the court during the same period. As art historian Kishwa Rizvi has recently argued, uh, Shahnameh illustrations produced under Abbas undertake a remarkable new artistic program. For the first time in the 400-year history of illustrating the Shahnameh, the artists working on Shahnameh is after Abbas's accession make great efforts to depict the piety of individual kings. Have a look at the illustration here. Um, here purportedly is the ancient Iranian ruler, Goshtasp, shown uh, just after he has slain a dragon. Um, of course, what's remarkable about the image is first that the image bears the likeness of Shah Abbas himself down to his long mustache. But more notably, Goshasp is shown in prayer. And of course, it's not just any old prayer, but by the presence, uh, sorry, this is a bit of a tacky animation, but by the presence of the Muharrem the Tasbi on his uh, prayer rug, it's you know, obviously a specifically Shi'i prayer. Um, as in his quotation from the Testament of Ardashir in the letter under uh, consideration, which I've just quoted, Abbas here is articulating a new understanding, I think, of Iranian kingship, uh, one in which Shi'i piety, right, one should not just uh, promote the religion, but one must also wage war against the damned, the enemies of Shi'ism, uh, and just rule uh, go hand in hand. Now, the draft of the letter, which I've just shared, uh, was not the one that was ultimately sent to Akbar. Uh, the, the London manuscript says that the letter was ultimately deemed to be too prideful and boastful. Uh, and instead, the letter, which was eventually sent to Akbar, thanked him for his advice before going on to justify the action taken against the Kizilbash as being a political exigency. Now, to conclude, we, what, we, we might read Abbas's rejection of Sohe Kol as another aspect of the solidification of Shi'i orthodoxy and the eclipse of Sufism, the subject of the recent book of Atta and Zali. Um, but it is uh, important to note, on the one hand, that the later 17th century separation of Erfan from Sufism, uh, from Tasavvuf, is not evident in the letter which condemns both Erfan and Sohe Kol. Um, instead, perhaps we might read this letter as an attempt to define Iranian kingship in a world in which the foundations of Abbas's kingly rule were still fragile. Now, I know we're all eager to get to tea, so I'll just pass through my later sort of references to Sohe Kol uh, in, the, in the later Safavid period, but uh, needless to say, the uh, Sohe Kol continues to be invoked uh, by poets uh, ranging from Sheikh Bahai. Uh, to the court poet uh, of Shah Abbas II, Sa'eb, who had, of course, returned to Iran from Mughal India, where you can see very clearly Solhe Kol referring to, uh, to the macrocosm. And of course, the, the term Solhe Kol is also uh, very much present in, in anti-Sufi uh, polemics um, uh, from, from the later Safavid period, such as this quotation from Muhammad Tahir al-Qumi. Uh, so 
uh, by way of conclusion, in this talk I have argued uh, that ethical texts which circulated in the early Safavid period based the ethics of rule on a theory of macrocosm in which harmony and body, society and cosmos represent the ideal state of being. Mystics like Azar Kevan in the early Safavid period put these ethics into practice in their spiritual exercises by promoting bodily harmony through dietary practice, social harmony through religious pluralism, and finally celestial harmony through the veneration of planets. Such practices they described as universal harmony or harmony with all. While these practices developed in mid-century Iran, they attracted the interest instead of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, who similarly in his Dine Elahi uh, promoted vegetarianism, a kind of religious toleration and the worship of the sun. Distinguishing his own rule from that of his Mughal counterpart, Shah Abbas rejected Akbar's invitation to universal harmony, and instead put forth an argument that Iranian royal legitimacy was not based on, on simply harmony, but instead on the twin notions of rulership uh, and religion, um, a notion that he deemed evidently to be more compatible with Shiaism. Uh, widespread across Iran in the early Safavid period, then the notion of Soltek Kol uh, and universal harmony became an idea against which Iranian kingship came to be defined, unlike in Mughal India, uh, where at least under the, the reigns of Akbar and his immediate successors was an idea whereby kingship was defined. Thank you very much for your attention. Look forward to questions. The previous talk just has, uh, set the scene for us to move on to look at the philosophy, religions, and the arts, and especially the next paper that uh, will discuss a, a topic of philosophy, mysticism, very much rooted and fed by the wisdom of earlier sages of this land. I dare not call it anything by name anymore, <laughs> or the traditions. And none uh, um, more competent at the helm than Dr. Sajjad Rezvi, who uh, a colleague from nearer university to us in this uh, uh, country at um, Exeter. Dr. Uh, Rezvi is the Associate Professor of Islamic Studies, Islamic uh, uh, Intellectual History, and Director of the Center for the Study of Islam at the University of Exeter. He is a specialist on Safavid Mughal philosophy and the author of Mullah Sadra and Metaphysics, and is currently completing his monograph on the philosophy in 18th century Iran and North India. And I will invite him, without um, stealing his thunder anymore, to take us on a journey to uh, meet Mullah Sadra. Uh, thank you, Nargis, and thank you to, to Charles, who originally invited me to Sarah, and to Vincenzo. Um, I don't think I was much uh, trouble for Vincenzo because I live in London. And of course, uh, thank you to the Sadava Foundation for uh, this wonderful event, uh, um, which uh, it's always fun to be part of something like this. Um, it's not terribly difficult for me to have uh, accepted the kind invitation uh, for the simple reason anyone who knows me knows that kind of uh, philosophy in the Safavid period is, is who I am, uh, at least in one sense. And although I would never call myself an Iranian, um, in our family, we consider Iran to be home. Uh, so if you go to Iran, it's like you're going home. And there's a whole kind of set of really strange ironies there because um, the, the modern uh, system of, of visas doesn't necessarily recognize that uh, belonging to the homeland. Um, the, the Iranian uh, consulate is not as, um, as gracious to me all the time as I would like to, it to be. Um, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about in some ways nicely segues from what Dan was talking about quite simply because uh, part of it is about Shiraz and part of it is about Shiraz as a, a space for philosophy and part of it is also about the sorts of practices which go into uh, what I'm going to call philosophy. Um, but let me start uh, with um, some reflections on this notion which people have used and um, I don't have a problem using, um, which is this idea of a Safavid um, renaissance. Um, and, and for me, that uh, renaissance, the, the active um, uh, construction, uh, the revival of the classics, uh, 
constitutes two sets of, of learning. Uh, one being the ancient wisdoms uh, primarily of Hellenic Neoplatonism, uh, and to a certain extent, Iranian, uh, ancient Iranian wisdoms are, are sort of put into that, although the actual content of that is, is very meager, uh, or it certainly doesn't seem to be authentically Iranian uh, in, in any recognizable sense. Uh, and the second one is uh, the excavation of the early Shia tradition. And uh, for that, perhaps the, the best example is uh, the introduction to Majlisi's Bihar Lanwar, which lists a series of fundamental texts which define the tradition. And if you read that, you get a sense of what he thinks the Shi'i tradition is and what I think is a good snapshot, which tells you how the Safavids, certainly in the, in the 17th century, felt about uh, who they were and, and what they were espousing. With uh, respect to uh, the philosophers in this period, in Shiraz and later Isfahan, um, I've previously written about how I think this notion of the school of, Shira, uh, school of Isfahan is not terribly useful as a concept, partly because not all of them were from Isfahan or had much ties to it, um, and also because there's no such thing as a school with a, with a set of school doctrines and practices. Um, but it was Shiraz which was more important. But one thing which you could say uh, united most of those thinkers in the 16th and the 17th century was a sense of, of how they saw philosophy and where they saw philosophy stemming from. And an important element of this was um, the conscious evocation of Sohravadi, who uh, has already been mentioned by, by Dan, uh, of the notions of uh, philosophy as uh, a universal, uh, prophetically a gifted um, inquiry of a transmission which is uh, associated with a set of spiritual practices, um, including the, the 40 days vegetarianism that we've, we've mentioned already, uh, and, uh, and especially of, of uh, the spiritual practices being guided and led by a sage, um, who uh, Sohra Wadi famously called Qayyim uh, bil Kitab, the one who kind of establishes uh, the book in some interesting ways. Um, so you've got these, uh, this, this dual heritage, the, the broadly Neoplatonic, uh, with certain texts such as the Theology of Aristotle, the Orthologia uh, works, which go back to Proclus, uh, the Golden Verses of Pythagoras, uh, and the commentaries by Proclus and Iamblichus. Uh, echoes of the Hermetica, um, and uh, other texts which were produced primarily in the Kindi circle in the early uh, Islamic period. Now, the, the question is, is how, what do we, uh, how do we make sense of it, and how do we locate Iran within this? Now, the idea that um, Iran is a space for philosophy or philosophizing is, of course, not new to Safavid, the Safavid period at all. There are plenty of witnesses before the Safavid period which talk about some sort of privileged space for Iran and of Persians. I, I recognize throughout this paper I'll often be kind of um, conflating Iran and Persians, which is perhaps a problem. Um, it probably is a problem. Um, but it's partly because sometimes the texts do that. There's a lot more talk about Persians and what Persians do necessarily always than, um, necessarily than, than Iran itself. Uh, so for example, we have the, the famous, um, I would say infamous historian Ibn Khaldun uh, writing in the Muqaddimah that, um, uh, you know, almost like in parentheses, the problem with the Persians. The problem with the Persians was that they were uh, very much attached to knowledge and particularly the intellectual sciences. He, if you know something about Ibn Khaldun, you actually know that he doesn't particularly like the intellectual sciences. Uh, things like logic and philosophy are not uh, particular disciplines which he, he, he likes uh, to promote. Um, and alongside that, there are a number of people who have talked about how uh, you know, pretty much all the famous philosophers and theolo theologians in the world of Islam have always been Persians. Um, this is a nice uh, thing to always remind uh, contemporary sectarians uh, when they bring this thing up, saying, well, you know, you wouldn't really have any Sunni theology if they w it wasn't for the Persians uh, in, the med in the medieval period. Um, and the fact that uh, there is a certain memory 
of this place called uh, Jundashapur uh, in the late Sasanian period, which was considered to be a primary site for philosophy, for the sciences, for medicine, uh, which is uh, then drawn upon when uh, Baghdad is established and institutions of, of learning and translation are established in Baghdad uh, with this uh, very conscious sense in which they're trying to recreate uh, Jundashapur. Alongside that, you have uh, certain other witnesses like Saeed al-Andalusi, who famously, and perhaps slightly unusually, when he's talking about the different climes, the seven climes, uh, the, the sort of the cosmology of, of, of the world, uh, places Iran at the first climb. It's unusual because most people don't do that. Um, so for him, um, Iran uh, lies at the center of the cosmos. And, and then as you go out, you get the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Indians, and it goes out. And interestingly, the Arabs don't seem to, to, to figure in this at all, uh, despite the fact that he is someone who's writing in, in Andalus further west and doesn't seem to be a Persian at all in any, in any sense. Um, and uh, you have other um, accounts which place Iran at the center of intellectual inquiry. For example, Abul Fazl Bayhaqi's um, history of uh, Sultan Mas'ud, and uh, when it evokes uh, the example of someone like Biruni. Of course, there, there are other accounts which uh, perhaps uh, decenter Iran and Persians, uh, of which there are many as well. Uh, so apart from the fact uh, that they point out that most of the areas of Iran are in the third and fourth climb, uh, you have this very interesting and I think quite polemical citation uh, by the belletrist um, Abu Hayyan Tawhidi uh, at the beginning of the 11th century, who's citing Ibn al-Muqaffa, which is very interesting because I suspect Ibn al-Muqaffa would not have said this. Um, and the citation goes like this. He says, the, the, the Persians are masters of politics, civility, rules, and protocols. The Greeks have science and philosophy. Um, the Indians have thought, reflection, discernment, and magic. Magic's really important. Uh, and the Turks have courage and audacity. Um, interestingly, the, the clinching sentence is, the Arabs have valor, hospitality, loyalty, heroism, generosity, humor, and eloquence. Uh, the Arabs seem to have a lot more virtues than anyone else does. Uh, a certain irony when you think that it's is supposed to be Ibn al saying this. So there is a sense in which you've got witnesses which place Iran at the center of the pursuit of the sciences and Persians at the center of that, and there are others which decenter that to a certain extent. But the, the, the main uh, tradition which uh, places Iran at the center afterwards, as I've already mentioned, uh, is very much the Sohrawardian one. Um, I deliberately don't use uh, the term Ishraqi or Illuminationist th tradition because I personally don't think there is such a thing, and we can discuss that later. Um, there is Sohrawardi and maybe one other person who espouses his doctrines. Most other people who are described as Ishraqis are not Ishraqi in any discernible sense because they disagree with Sohrawardi on key uh, issues of metaphysics uh, and other areas of philosophy. So Sahrawardi explicitly invokes the, the wisdom of the mystic Orient. Uh, he has, uh, as Dan's mentioned, these uh, invocations uh, to Huraksh and, and other invocations to uh, the celestial bodies as part of a spiritual practice. He has the vegetarianism. He has um, the following of the sage. Now, one element of making sense of what the Sahrawardi in tradition is, and the person who's perhaps done the most, is the the late uh, Henri Corbin. And uh, this morning when I was thinking about it, I thought actually what I probably should have presented was what does Henri Corbin mean by Islam Iranien? Uh, because that kind of encapsulates in many ways uh, the sorts of intellectual and, and spiritual uh, practices of the Safavid period in itself. But uh, as Corbin puts it, uh, for him, uh, his understanding of Sahrawi, the Islam Irania, it's something which is primarily to do with esotericism. It's a theosophy orientale, although I would never use the word theosophy for all sorts of other reasons. Um, it's uh, linked to uh, ancient Persian wisdoms as something which is somehow revealed. Um, it's a way of orientation. 
And um, it's uh, uh, the, the source of certain key notions about the nature of existence, about the, the, the comparative um, qualities or levels or degrees of light and darkness which define different entities in the cosmos. Uh, it's about notions of time and non-time. It's about the, the, uh, the confluence of mysticism and philosophy. And it's about things like the confluence of angels and, and platonic forms. And uh, we do know that uh, within uh, the philosophical tradition, you have figures like uh, Mullah Sadra, who often um, uh, are described as being Ishraqis, uh, who explicitly say that some of their key metaphysical ideas, for example, is notion of the modulation of existence, um, goes back to ancient Persian wisdoms via Sohrawardi. Although, of course, on many other points, uh, he, he disagrees uh, with Sohrawardi, including in his glosses on Sohrawardi's um, uh, uh, wisdom of the Orient or wisdom of illumination, depending on how you translate Ishraq. Now, originally what I thought I would do was to talk about how the various texts in the Safavid period refer to Iran and conceptualize Iran. Uh, and then I suddenly realized that the word Iran is very rarely mentioned in those texts. So I'll come back to that um, and one particular text later. But let me say something which is much more consistent with what I, I do know something about, which is uh, features of uh, philosophy, and particularly philosophy as a way of life and a set of spiritual practices in this period, and, and how that uh, defines uh, the philosophers who come from Shiraz, uh, and also how that is then uh, carried over into India. Um, one of my more recent uh, interests is, is how philosophy then travels from Iran uh, to India and how some of the spaces in India are then redefined as being the Shiraz and the Esfahan of Hind. Um, already in the earlier part of the 17th century, you have uh, Jaunpur, which becomes an important place for the study of philosophy. And uh, we have uh, these famous accounts from the court of, of Shah Jahan um, referring to Jaunpur as Shiraz e Hind. So in terms of the basic uh, assumptions about what the nature of philosophy is in this period and of how it's linked to a certain ethical living, uh, you have this notion that the intellect defines a human. And the intellect is the basic foundation of action. And uh, so therefore, inquiring into the nature of, of truth and reality um, are, to a certain extent, psychological motivations for action. Um, it doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily understand that there could be a dissonance between what you know and what you do, but there was a sense in which the, the life of the intellect somehow defined how it is that you were supposed to comport yourselves. So sound reason was a good to be, um, to be obtained and to be, uh, uh, to be embraced and, and, of course, to be promoted. And within that, uh, the thinkers were re relatively optimistic about the potential for the human intellect to understand reality. The second element is the notion uh, that the intellect could be perfected. And the perfection of the human intellect, the perfecting of the human intellect, was very much the goal of philosophy. But this process was not pu purely about uh, a, a disembodied set of contemplations, but rather carried with it, it, uh, with it uh, sets of uh, religious and ritual acts, uh, theurgic acts, uh, which I mentioned before as well, uh, which were supposed to then bolster the, the possibility. So there had to be a, um, a coming together of um, the, the life of the mind with the spiritual practices of the body, because the body was very much the way in which uh, the activity of the intellect and the, uh, and, and the spirit was, uh, uh, was manifest. And the end, the end of this practice was um, theosis, ta'allu, which again uh, Dan mentioned, uh, which becomes the absolute central point. So this is a point on which um, Mir Damad, Mullah Sadra, Sheikh Baha'i, various other figures absolutely agree that uh, 
the whole point of acquiring knowledge, the whole point of perfecting the self, the whole point of undergoing this disciplining of, of the self and the person is so that one becomes uh, divine. What that meant, of course, was a reference back to um, Plato uh, in the uh, Timaeus and also in Theaetetus, uh, that the, the process of, of doing philosophy, practicing philosophy in order to become divine was a way in which you escaped the vicissitudes and the particularities of this world and you um, attain to a status, a divine status, where, whereby you could discern the rational order in the cosmos so that you could really see, see where, where things are placed. It was, in a sense, a, a pursuit of cosmic justice insofar as cosmic justice is an understanding of, place, of things in their proper place uh, and not in the way perhaps they might uh, present themselves uh, to us. And so alongside that, these, those practices which are, are then put, uh, placed uh, in, uh, alongside the, the contemplation are, uh, in a sense, a therapy, a therapy of the soul with clear salvific soteriological ends as well. And to, uh, in a sense, uh, to kind of uh, uh, vernacularize it, it was not just the idea that truth will set you free, but also um, doing the good will also set you free. The, the obvious uh, problem, perhaps, with this understanding of philosophy, the, uh, the communal living, the spiritual practice, the, the, the following of a sage or a master, uh, is that it's um, deeply elitist. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell us uh, what most people thought. It might um, also be one of the reasons why you get a, a lot of popular sentiment expressed in poetry and other sources about um, philosophers as being um, somewhat aloof, uh, difficult people, um, and know that they probably were, unless they were um, dispersing patronage as they should do as uh, members of the elite. And uh, increasingly, we know much more about um, those circles, the madrasas and other places where philosophy was practiced and what sort of uh, things they might have done. But there's still a lot uh, which we need to uh, make sense of. Now, I'm going to skip the stuff on theurgy because I think Dan's pretty much done it. Um, let me just mention a few um, examples of how it is that this notion of, of philosophy as a way of life and a set of spiritual practices in this period is then um, uh, blended with a very uh, explicit um, Shi uh, affiliation. Uh, one example, uh, to give one example, um, an individual who's been mentioned earlier, um, Riyasuddin Dashtaki, has um, a short uh, philosophical work, which is known as Dalil al-Huda, in which he talks about the pursuit of philosophy, the, the desire to understand reality as issuing from the city of knowledge, of course, from Ali. And so a philosophy is not just a prophetic inheritance, but it's also something which is nurtured uh, in, and this phrase comes up in so many texts, um, nurtured in the niche of prophecy, um, which is Walaya, um, the, the imams, the Shi'i imams themselves. And so the practice of, of hikmah, the practice of, of wisdom, uh, of philosophy, is not distinct from trying to make sense of what the, the Shi'i tradition is, what the teachings of the imams are in, in particular as well. And there, there are many examples of commentaries, for example, on, um, on Shi'i hadith, uh, works of exegesis, which deliberately do this, the mixing together of Neoplatonism with the Shi'i tradition to say that they're, they're, in a sense, two paths from a singular truth which are entirely um, uh, compatible and um, homologous. There are, there are a number of other um, thinkers around the same time, the Shamsuddin Khafri, uh, who uh, dies in around uh, 1535, uh, who writes in this, in this light and also brings in the Safavid period, he's probably the first person who systematically is also 
incorporating the uh, monism of Ibn Arabi into these schemes as well. And of course, his, his son and his grandson, the two Dehadars, who then add uh, the occult or the, a heavy dose of occult and magic into this process. And then they, of course, take it to India. Um, so there's this interesting kind of historical problem of what happens from the time that Dehadar leaves for India and Mullah Sadwa what's going on in Shiraz, which also then begs the question of, of who is someone like Azar Kaivan studying with um, and what that milieu is, because also by this time, uh, we don't, we're not entirely sure where Fatullah Shirazi is as well in this particular period in the middle of the 16th century. Uh, another important figure, Amir Damad, does a, a very similar thing. He actually defines his philosophy as the Yemeni philosophy, Hekma Yemaniya, uh, and in that it's a very explicit way in which he says that uh, his philosophy is again um, nurtured from the niche of, of prophecy and is superior to, to Greek philosophy precisely for that reason. Although, of course, when you look at the actual contents of the philosophy, um, there's not much explicit uh, citation of uh, for example, scriptural texts which might uh, explain how this actually happens. It seems to be primarily a, a rhetorical device to, uh, to explain why um, what he's doing is very important. The prophetic um, inheritance of uh, philosophy is something which was already established well before the Safavid period, but uh, in a number of texts such as Mullah Sadra's uh, uh, Asfar and also the, his text on the incipients of the cosmos. He gives a certain genealogy, which is an extremely well-known one. Um, if, of course, if philosophy is a prophetic inheritance, it has to start with the first prophet, who, of course, is Adam. So philosophy starts with Adam, uh, and from there it goes uh, to Seth and uh, his successor, Seth, um, and his successor in this kind of she sense of being his wasi and his wali. And from there it goes to Hermes, who's uh, known in the Arabic tradition as Idris, and then it goes to Noah, and then um, from there it, it uh, is disseminated to the different um, peoples um, of the earth. It goes to the Babylonians, it goes to the Persians, it goes to the Indians. Interestingly, it goes to the Romans and the Greeks later. Uh, and explicitly he says that philosophy was not ancient in those places, but they needed um, Abraham to actually... That in another account, they needed Solomon to take uh, philosophy to them. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Arabs uh, then um, brought it home uh, after that, uh, after the, uh, the Greek uh, interlude. There is, of course, a lot more that could be said about notions of uh, theosis, which I mentioned briefly, uh, why it is that, um, that philosophy, the, the acquisition of philosophy, has to be about this resemblance to the creator, um, to the um, uh, acquiring a, a resemblance to the creator. Um, but let me uh, just park some of those um, uh, comments on the nature of philosophy to one side and look more specifically at this issue of the histories of philosophy. Um, and in particular, um, to one text, um, I don't think I'll be able to get to the second text. The second text is... is is an interesting one because it's written in India. Um, it's Maqsud Ali Tabrizi's translation of Shahrazuzi's Nuzhat al Arwah, which was written uh, for Akbar, although it was finished after Akbar died, just after he died. And uh, Tabrizi is an interesting person. He's described as being a Sufi master uh, who uh, turns up and uh, gains the patronage of um, Abdurrahim Khan Khanan. Uh, and from there, he he, um, uh, he comes to the attention of, of Akbar and then later Jahangir. There's also a story that he might at some point have been appointed as a governor of Gujarat, but the people in Gujarat didn't particularly like him, so he never really took up his, his office. Um, and in that, you have a certain uh, presentation of ancient wisdom in which there is a particular entry, entry on Zoroaster, which is interesting. Um, but I don't think I'll have time to discuss that. Let me just discuss um, uh, another text, uh, which is a later 17th century text um, by a, uh, a student of Mir Damad, Qutbuddin Ashkivari, who is also known as Sharif al So there's, for example, there's a Persian Quranic exegesis, 
uh, uh, attributed to Sharif al Lahiji, which has been published and has been available since the 1950s. Uh, and for many years, people had no idea that this was the same guy. Um, this is one of the problems when you have a biographical dictionaries mentioning different names and, and titles for people. It can get quite confusing, uh, especially if people don't really look at the manuscripts. Um, but he clearly is the same person. Uh, he's a, a student of Mir Damad. We know that from the internal evidence of his texts. Uh, so he's originally from Lahijan, studies in Isfahan, and then he returns to Lahijan where he dies. Uh, he seems to have written this particular text, which is known as Mahbub al Qulub, um, in towards the end of his life um, in Lahijan. And uh, the text um, is a, a remarkably interesting and, um, in literary terms, uh, quite um, a polished um, work, which is in the mixture of Arabic and Persian, which again becomes very much a feature of uh, this period. Uh, divided up into three parts. Um, in a sense, it's a history of, of learning or the history of the world um, and also a history of Shiism um, because those two are basically the same thing. Um, there are three parts. The first part is on the ancient philosophers, uh, starting with, of course, with, with Adam and Seth and so forth, uh, and including most of the, f the famous Greek philosophers. The second part is on the uh, philosophers um, and some Sufis of the Islamic period. And the third part, which is the part which has yet to be um, edited, um, is a biography of the Shi'i Imams and of key Shi'i figures, most of whom are Persians, um, including the last one, which is on Mir Damad. Now, um, Alongside that, he also had an interest in the occult. Um, I'm not primarily interested in occult. We have colleagues who are far more interested in the occult, and sometimes I think they kind of overdo their pushback against what they call occultophobia. Um, but um, he has an interesting text which has been translated, uh, which has been edited called the Lataif al Hisab, um, which is a, a set of ideas around letterism and numerology, which has been published. Um, uh, and many other works. Now, with respect to the the, the Mahbub, the, the, the one particular thing I want to talk about, apart from this uh, historical um, construction of, of where philosophy comes, is um, this entry, which is quite long on Zoroaster. And part of that entry comes straight from Shahrazuri. Um, but uh, what he does in, in, in this text is he, he tries to find all sorts of other sources to understand who Zoroaster is. He, he has citations from Khutbuddin Shirazi. He has citations, as he calls it, from the Zend Avesta. Um, and he, he tries to claim that certainly that his, um, his portrayal of Zoroaster is, is an authentic one which goes back to early sources. And then alongside that, he, he mixes his portrayal of Zoroaster with um, Shi texts. For, for example, hadith on how Zoroaster's teachings on God and on light and darkness are entirely compatible with these um, sayings of the Shi imams. Uh, the final section is on messianism and how Zoroaster's teachings on the messianic redeemer of the last days is basic, basically the same as the Shi concept of the Mahdi. Now, what is quite clear here is that you're getting um, the emergence of or the portrayal of Zoroaster as this um, amalgamated figure, part ancient Persian, part Neoplatonist, um, and part um, a Shi'i prophet. Uh, there's a certain uh, ambiguity about whether he explicitly calls uh, Zoroaster a prophet in the in the entry, uh, because there are two different places where he mentions prophethood, and in one case he seems to suggest he is, in another case he doesn't. But this, uh, in many ways, I think, um, exemplifies the way in which philosophy and philosophers are seen in this period. A mixture of the ancient Iranian, a mixture of the Neoplatonic, and a mixture of the Shi'i and to, uh, to basically show how these three are entirely compatible. Um, and uh, that's perhaps where uh, you have a, a real development in the Safavid period. 
So as, whereas before you could say that there's plenty of evidence of the confluence of the Neoplatonic and the ancient Iranian and other themes in the pre-Safavid period, uh, the, the primary um, addition, in a sense, to the conception and the practice of philosophy in this period, which is exemplified by something like Mahbub al-Qulub, is the addition of the Shi element, uh, which, of course, is in a sense, what you would expect, and certainly what you would expect in uh, this late um, period. And that's, I guess, where I, I would like to stop, um, because it's precisely then raising this question of what do we understand by this notion of Shiism in this particular period. Um, I, uh, contrary to what a number of other people think, I don't think Shiism as such is defined by the Safavid period. I think that's a huge exaggeration, which is part of a polemical construction of how modern Iranian and modern uh, other types of identities work out in the region. Um, but in philosophical terms, you could say that it's really in the Safavid period where this very um, intimate link between philosophy and Shiism is made. Um, so much so that nowadays, if you ask most people about the um, the reception of, of Islamic philosophy, they always think of it as being something uh, Shi'i or something which is associated with Safad Iran. So if I say to people I work on, on later Islamic philosophy, they'll say to me, oh, you work on Shi'i Shi philosophy. And I kind of have to say, I don't think it's the same thing and I don't really know what Shi'i philosophy means. But that association is, is one which becomes uh, very strong and there's plenty of evidence internal uh, which suggests it. So the question of what Shiism is comes back again in that. And I think I'm maybe you taking are. too much time. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I want to say that there was a period of time between Charles's original um, invitation and my uh, generation of an abstract and the actual writing of the paper. And in case we get cut off and I will move rather quickly in order to make sure that I don't take up too much time. I'm really interested in the idea of the idea of the Safavids. <clears throat> and my argument uh, is that uh, there are approximately three periods uh, in, which I'm, in which I think the Safavids have played a particular role in the last X number of years, and I'll talk about that. Uh, and in the first two, they were colonized, abstracted for particular purposes. And it's only really been in the last, I think, 10 or so years, as epitomized, I think, by some of the papers here today uh, and some of the papers to which I will refer in, in another uh, event just up the road a few weeks ago, where we've demonstrated they've broken free of, of that kind of a constraint. So that's kind of my, um, my argument there. Uh, and that I think in the last 10 years in particular, there's too much going on in both Shiism and Safavids. So the study of Shiism, 12 or Shiism in particular, and the study of the Safavids, both colonized pretty effectively, I think, up until 2005, 2010, and then I think the shackles have been broken. Uh, and I'm gonna hype a lot of British sorts of things, um, being British, um, that we're doing here, which I think we actually do, uh, this is being taped, right, much more effectively than those Americans. Uh, now, if I can, again, master the technology, there's going to be a quiz, uh, and the quiz is the best book on the Safavids. Now, this can be your book. Have you written a book on the Safavids? Uh, I doubt it will be any of the things that I've written, but there's a quiz, and it's going to come around slide six or seven or so. So this talk is framed in two ways. One, I had to teach this course on Shiism in the United States over the summer, and then a few weeks ago, up north by the Ismaili Institute, there was a paper uh, a conference, a three-day conference called the Renaissance of, if you can't see it, the Renaissance of Shi'i Islam in the 15th and 17th century. That is Safavids. And at that period, I said at that time that I gave up a talk, I asked for a show of hands of people who knew about this gathering. One hand went up. So I asked this question of you. Did you know about that gathering? Okay. There was a lot, there was an online audience, and there were a lot of people listening online. But I didn't perceive that there was a lot of interchange, and Sajjad and I were kind of remarking about it's nice to see Sajjad, because we said, isn't this interesting? There wasn't a lot of cross-attendance that's going on here. And I think this is interesting. In that respect, Shiism can stand in for art, architecture, lit language, literature, whatever it is, despite the efforts of at least four roundtables, uh, the first one in Paris, and then uh, Charles Goodself, uh, my smaller self, and Bert Frogner uh, in Germany as well, we still are kind of separated from each other. 
Uh, and I think you can find this out by simply looking at bibliography and footnotes. And this, was, uh, this is going on up basically till the present. Um, leaf around and see if people are talking about uh, the Safavids among the Shia, people who do Shia studies, there's not much, and cross, cross ways as well, there's not much the other way around either. So we're still sort of operating in a vacuum. And I found that teaching this stuff to undergraduates in the liberal arts education was fascinating because they didn't know, unlike the British system where you're teaching third or fourth years, where they've decided they're going to do this thing, so they kind of know where Iran was and they'd heard of Muhammad the prophet and such. In an age today in a liberal arts education, they only knew that Shia and Sunni were killing each other. That's kind of what they grew up with. Post-2003, that's what there was. That's the environment there. And I would suggest that that uh, is a big problem, but nevertheless, it is the manner, it's the atmosphere, this age of sectarianism in which we're presently uh, operating. I'm going to kind of morph to slides, and then I usually manage to forget my own text, but I wanted to try and keep in this. So I would contend that the Safavids and Shiism kind of represents something like this, the proverbial blind man and the elephant. There is this kind of a thing, but we're all working on our little bits, and we really don't kind of talk to each other. And so if you look at that, I love this one down here. Uh, an elephant is a fan, a wall, a rope, uh, a tree, a snake, a spear. And that's kind of what Safavids and, and Shiism are. We're not talking to each other. And sometimes even within Shi'i studies, we're not talking to each other uh, as well. We all come up with different kinds of conceptualizations about that. I think at the same time, too, you'll find that uh, undergraduates, and, and I perceive that most of the folks in this audience are not academics. Okay, which, which is interesting. I, I find that quite interesting. You get comments from students, master students, and I can try and find out what, where they're coming from because we're talking to you, but maybe we're not talking to you. Uh, or we're talking at you and not with you. We're not having that kind of a conversation. So this is where I, I kind of think we are. But of course, this is the age of a lot of other kinds of challenges. Uh, so we have a 24-year-old daughter who has six windows, I like to say. She has six windows open at any one time. Okay, everything's online. Okay, and she's got, I hope I have this in the right sequence, but I may not. There we go. She's got the internet with which to compete. You can see I don't have a subscription to either of these, so I represent some sort of purity. Uh, so there's these kinds of social kinds of things, too. So, and also, I think you will find that academics certainly would realize that students are reading less an awful lot. In my undergraduate example is I read War and Peace for college in, in a week. And now, of course, you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't read it at all. So we all, not just students, but all of us have a lot of competing attention with which we're struggling. And here are we academics trying to make some sort of an impact. And that, that gets into this notion of the American versus the British Academy. And I think there's some interesting differences between this. One is uh, this notion of interaction with the public. What are you paying your money for? If we can't talk to you somehow, and move you from one place to another, then we've got to reformulate these kinds of things and look at these kinds of things uh, in a different uh, kind of a way. So the way I do this, and again, this is kind of a teaching-based discussion because it's based on the kinds of questions and perceptions I get from my own students, whether in the United States or here. What I try to say is, look, what we're trying to do, what the goal of, of academics is, is to come up with a new and original contribution to the field. That's what a PhD or to some extent a master's dissertation is. And it bespeaks a reference to something called the old uh, and the conventional, what everybody says. Uh, and the, the priority then is to be looking at that kind of a discussion as the, uh, as the notion of making a contribution to the field. So it's not necessarily adding tons of new information that's useful, but what do we make of that information in order to push the field forward. That's kind of my teaching discussion here at the master's level, at the fourth year honors level, but especially at the PhD uh, level at all. So we have this book. Everybody's got this book. OK, you've got this image of it. And you get, you get air miles. OK, come see me later with your bank account details and such. And uh, well, transfer the air miles if you get this book. It actually has been referred to very briefly in passing. And this is it. This is Sholay Quinn's book. Okay, historical writing during the reign of Shah Abbas. I actually read it over the Christmas holidays one time when it originally came out. It's a year 2000, I think. Is that right, Charles? I think it's about the year 2000. <clears throat> Fascinating book from a variety of different kinds of reasons. The most important reason of which is, in, in my view, the way it struck me then and still strikes me today, is what she tried to do in the latter part of the book was look at the same incident, okay, the, uh, the fall from power and death of Kizilbash officer Yakub Khan, uh, in the Shah Abbas period, from the viewpoint of several different chronicles. And lo and behold, she found out they all thought about it in a very different way. And her answer to this was, let's look at the background, the agenda of each one of these writers, 
and think about why it is. I mean, part of her argument is we'll never know what happened about Yaqub Khan. We want to ask a different kind of a question. Let's ask a question about how they got there, the why of it. Why are they emphasizing certain things or ignoring uh, certain things in particular? Um, <clears throat> and this gets, again, back to this notion of ways of looking at things. In effect, her writers, and there's Yahu Khan, trying to figure out what the heck happened. And she's saying, let's step back and look at that and figure out what the uh, agenda is there. There's some more material in this genre. Um, a woman called Sonia Brentes, uh, 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 edited a volume of the Journal of Urban Modern History in 2009, and then she has this collection of articles from 2010, and she's talking about travel logs. So we have a lot of, uh, we have court chronicles, and then we move to travel logs, same kinds of important sources for what is going on in this period. And uh, Sonia, there's, there's a juicy quote from page 80 of that particular volume. It's never sufficient to measure the trustworthy, na trustworthiness of the narrative by scrutinizing the facts. It's the take. There's a point to be made. And you really want to tuck into that. And you may not always be able to answer the question with which you commence. You may have to shift your question. And you have to shift it then what uh, Sholay is talking about and hear also what Sonia is talking about based on what you can say. And sometimes you can't do that. There were a number of papers. Uh, Edmund was here uh, earlier um, uh, that he and Willem put together from the conference uh, in 2002. You can't see that. But this was here in this room, 2002 finally came out in 2012. And if you want to look at, in that same genre, you can look in papers in there by McCabe, Valois, and Sonia, again, has a paper there. How do we know what we know? And don't we need to, in effect, be careful? <clears throat> and I would argue that we take it to the next step, and we need to be careful of ourselves. So we're asking the question as well. Just as the court chronicler, or the traveler, in a sense, we ourselves, in the way we, in the questions which we ask and the way in which we approach them, then have our own kind of part in this process. And so therefore, when I talk to students about this, the way I answer this problem is I teach the history of the field. So they can know where they are at any given moment, or at least think about that, and then understand what they might conceptualize as being what is new and original as a contribution to the field. Know where you're at. There's a bazaar of ideas there. Insert yourself at a point and know where you kind of figure into the larger narrative. And as part of this, then, I talk about the colonization or the abstraction of Safavid studies from its earliest years in the last century on up until, I think, about 2010. And against that context, then, I like to talk to them about three important dates. One is pre-78, 79, and here's a picture from the fascinating picture I found of the revolution, the, the one that's always stuck in my mind, the early, early days, the flower being handed to the soldier. There's the collapse of the wall, and there's 9-11. These are the kinds of things which, which some of the students, 9-11 at least, have been brought at the wall. What was that? The Cold War? What was that? They, don't, they have no idea uh, what that is. Bridge of spies uh, notwithstanding, they don't get that mentality uh, whatsoever. <clears throat> So I'd like to suggest quickly that prior to 1979, there was a certain take on both Shiism and Safavids. And my argument is that at 79, there was a, a moment where we could have realized where some of these issues were coming from, taken a different direction, but we didn't. We went, in, in terms of historiography, we kind of went back. So you had two groups of scholars looking at uh, uh, Shiism, uh, the classicists who did up to the Safavid period, mainly dealt in Arabic, and the modernists who did the 16th century and after, who mainly did Persian. And they mainly didn't speak to each other. They mainly kind of did things here and did things there. Um, no kinds of round tables or anything like that mark that period, to my knowledge. So there wasn't recognition that there maybe even was a problem for which a possible round table was a potential solution. The classicists were Madeline, who's still around, Eliash, who's not, and Tom Kohlberg, who will be in town at the Ismail Institute, I understand, on Monday, which I'm going to sadly miss, Corbin, who's been mentioned, and Nash. And that formulation of that idea that there was an affinity between Sinism and Shiism. An affinity, an association. They asked the same kinds of questions, were interested in the same kinds of things. And there's Corbin, and there's Nasser. The modernists did mainly post, did mainly Persian, uh, Lantern, uh, Binder, uh, the famous Ketty Algar uh, debate. Uh, but both sets of scholars, I think, um, that is the classicists and the modernists, all agreed that Shiism, that is to say, religion was going to go away anyway. So you didn't really need to pay much attention to it. It was going to follow this mythological understanding of the way religion went in the West and kind of become disappeared. Nobody pays any attention to it whatsoever. 
And modernization then would do that. Everybody would have lots of sliced bread or many different kinds of toothpaste and, and french fries or, uh, and, and hamburgers, and we'd all be a common un unitary culture. And there was a certain anti-nationalist dimension to that I, I got when I got to Scotland, where I saw, because the Scots, of course, are interested in these kinds of nationalist and non-nationalist and anti-nationalist sorts of things. And here again, if you want to look at the basic text provided that period, here's Brown's Literary History of Persia, uh, originally 1924, but republished in 53, and of course Lockhart's 1958, uh, The Fall of the Safavid Dynasty, or Dynasty, and epitomized, I think, by Roger Savory's work in 1980, um, where you can see that really very little progress has taken place. The Brown narrative and the Savory narrative are not really that different. Now, of course, all this is taking place in Iranian studies, Middle Eastern studies in general, against the background of the Cold War and modernization theory. And modernization theory is epitomized by works such as Daniel Lerner, Walt Rostow, Manfred Halpern, and such, published in 1963 for the Rand Corporation, a think tank in, in California, were looking at countering the Soviet polemic. And so they came up with this notion of stages of economic growth for which any society would want to go in order not to be Soviet. And with Halpern and others, they were looking at a sense of a strong secular figure, a strong leader, usually an army officer of some sort, most often trained in the West, who would be that vehicle for the anti-Soviet, pro-capitalist, pro-Western sort of development. In Iranian studies, this was epitomized, I think, in the modern period anyway, by such scholars as Cotton, Peter Avery, and even Fred Halliday, who, of course, famously missed Khomeini. And I, I love to quote to my students, I quote out and put it on the board, the famous passage, oh, don't pay any attention to religion, never mind, it's not serious. And this is 78, 79. He, he later came to Edinburgh and kind of explained why he would do that, which I'd be happy to talk to somebody else about, about later. But it was an interesting agenda. He had his agenda. He had his reasons for why he... Ask what he asked, and the answer is that he'd gone. So you end up with this epitomization in 1980. That's Shah Abbas I, and that's Mohammad Reza Shah, both modernizers. They liked Europeans, well, we like to be liked, and considering now myself as a European. Modernizers, sponsored philosophy, did all these kinds of things, and didn't really get along with religion. Religion was kind of in its place. And so there was this equation, either uh, overtly or covertly or implicitly, that these two individuals were kind of the same. Now, there were other ideas at the time. <clears throat> Algar, of course, had his ideas there. And again, in the debate between Algar and Nikki Kenny, uh, who was on, on my uh, PhD committee. And then, of course, Afabi comes along in 1980, and he talks about debates that are going on in the aftermath of the, de of the death of Boro Jerdi, which should have been in the books that were being written about Iran in the 1960s. All the people who were part of, many of the people who participated in those debates in those years turned up in the cabinet post-79. And yet we didn't know, the Iranians all knew who they were, <laughs> but we didn't know who they were. And lastly, which you can't see, I was on the PhD committee in 1997 of a guy called Michael Patrick Donovan, related to the Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan, who was, of course, the founder of the OSS, which was the CIA. And Donovan said, of this material at which he was looking, the national security stuff, he said, you know, the American security services knew that the Shah was becoming increasingly unpopular. They didn't have to figure on where it was headed, but they said, this is a pyramid. We're getting to the top of it. This is not going to last very much. Uh, he passed his PhD five and doesn't seem to have done anything that he's told anybody about. I don't know what he could possibly be doing now, and maybe I'm not allowed to comment. Well, anyway. But the 70s also in the Middle Eastern studies was the period of time with a lot of self-questioning going on in the United States, in particular at UCLA, where I was doing my PhD student. We all think of uh, Orientalism, 1978, of course, Edward Said was not in Middle Eastern studies. He was a professor of comparative literature, wasn't he, at Columbia University. Brodell is coming out. This is a long time. Finally, it gets translated. As long as it's in English, it's OK. We Americans don't do French and you know other strange languages. Uh, so that comes out in 72, 73. Samir Amin talking about underdevelopment in theory. Uh, again, it came out in French, as I recall, originally in 74. And again, a whole discussion of the influence of politics in Middle Eastern studies in 1970s. Merrick reports issue number 35, I think it was, but anyway, the founding in 73 comes out in 75. 
We're asking ourselves, PhD students asking themselves, what are we doing here? What's the implications of this modernization theory? And how can we look at other disciplines to begin to talk about where we should go at this point? Uh, let me see if I'm getting on the right. All right. And, and, and at the same time, however, uh, again, the notion is that around these same times, so Saber is finishing up 78, 79, right in those years, I expect. N no problem here. In fact, here's my favorite page from Lawrence Lockhart, 1970, where Lockhart talks about Alameda Majesty Mohammed Abakir as a rigid and fanatical, sorry, extremely bigoted, much to head, and fanatical formalist. I teach my students this page because I say, wow, that's a really big statement to make. Let's have a really good footnote. The footnote must be that long. There's no footnote at all. You can see it. Well, his fanatical son, Mohammed Bakker, is talking about the dad. And oh, yeah, see this little essay by Bakker and Madison. See, that proves the point. It's not to say this was bad scholarship. It was the sense of this is what's accepted. This was the narrative in 58, and it's still hanging on there in 1980. So 1960 to 1980 is 20 years plus two is 22 years. Really no change in the field on such a figure as Majlisi. What about post-79? I'll go through this very quickly. Again, in the immediate aftermath, my argument is the two groups of scholars were there, but there was no significant change. Middle Eastern studies, not to say Iranian studies, were on the precipice of making a, gosh, we got this all wrong in 1979. We had no idea what we were talking about. And what happens? You have that moment, and then they step back. Modernists and classicists, they repeat the whole thing. So you get this notion then, especially in the immediate aftermath, <coughs> of the classicists carrying on this kind of way. Shiism is esoteric. That has political implications, because if real Shiism is esoteric, then what's going on there now is not real Shiism. If real Shiism is esoteric, Sufi style, then what's going on in Iran past 79 is not genuine sheets. You had some other classicists, uh, again, Norman Calder, uh, Professor Madeline again, Hossein Mujahidassi, Devin Stewart, Sajidina, and Colbert, again, doing this kind of thing, but again, staying mainly in the background in that sense. Modernists, the standard ones, I think the most famous, is Said Arjaman's Shadow of God, which basically took Corbin and Nasser's notion and put it up in lights. This is it. This is it. This proves that you need to look at it in this way. Real Shiism is not what we have now. This is, this is not the real thing. And you get a series of discussions about this uh, as well in those works as well. And again, here's the standard books here. It's Orange Man's book in 84. Uh, again, Divine God, the 1992, but doesn't really hit the market, goes in the paper in before. And there's Mojan Moment, <clears throat> who encapsulates a lot of that traditional narrative, but does put out an interesting dilemma. Because, in effect, he argues that while it is true that most Iranians are Shia, I hope I get this part right, most Shia are not Iranians. Moment said that in 1985. And it's a big book, you've got to wade through it, but that's what he says. So in effect, what he's saying is, if you want to look at Shiism, you've got to look at something else, other kinds of things going on. Because Iranian Shiism is Iranian Shiism. It's contextual. Things are going on in Iran with Shiism that are particular to Iran, which don't necessarily translate uh, elsewhere. What about the modernist response on Shiism? It begins to go interesting places, taking up that kind of theme for a moment. I could list a whole bunch of other ones, but these are the ones that strike me as being quite interesting. Itzi Nakash, who was at uh, Brandeis uh, for a number of years, um, uh, wrote this book on the Shi'is of Iraq, and basically said, look, Shi'ism in Iraq is a kind of new thing, really, the last century or so, so I can mention from Karabal, yeah, that's true, but Shi'ism really took hold, it got legs, really, in the early part of the year. Fuad Jabbar talked about the Shia in Iraq as being of different classes, different persuasions, tribes, that's okay. Whatever they are, okay, the Marsh Arabs, right? different classes, some Shia affiliation with the Communist Party because they saw that as a way to get going, and of course the Shia of Lebanon <clears throat> as well. You also had some interesting work being done by other, what I call other modernists, and here's a couple of the standard names. Uh, Laura Deeb's book in particular is quite interesting, looking at Ashura Muharram, ceremonies from the viewpoints of what's going on in Lebanon. <clears throat> and then you have the anthropologists. You don't need to know these names or anything. I guess the slides will all go up. 
boy, there's a whole lot of interesting anthropological stuff following on from Momen's idea that while it's true that most Iranians are Shia, most Shia are not Iranians. And let's look at practices and such across the Shi'i world and talk about them as having importance, too. Uh, they have their own dynamics, their own contextualization. Same notion of Baharam, but vastly different celebration ways, again, based on local context. Uh, you can't see all of those. I apologize. But anyway, there's a good uh, listing of them there. Let me make sure I finish up. And then you have what I call the rapprochementistas. This is my Latin American phase. And you're talking about uh, interactions between Catholics and Shia, for example, a Christian-Muslim dialogue, if you will, on the back of the uh, President Khatami's Dialogue of Civilizations, uh, Mahoney, all in response, really, to Huntington's kind of throwback to this notion that there's something fundamental between Muslims, uh, between Islam uh, and, uh, and the West, as it were, if not Christianity. But by and large, for the Safavids, the old paradigms sort of held. And the way you can test that is to see if on general works about the Safavids, that same paradigm held. And here's two kinds of examples. Uh, Sturzen's 2010 work uh, and Stephen Dale. Stephen Dale is a really a mogul of this, if that's the term writing in 2009, but doing a chapter on the Safavids and basically replaced the kind of savory uh, uh, Brown Lockhart sort of memoir, uh, uh, paradigm. So what you have then around 2010 is you have this. Shah Abbas I is Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, and Bakr Medzlasi is Khomeini. That's the kind of implicit, if not explicit, paradigm. When religion gets out of the box, you have trouble. Things begin to happen, and that's kind of the Safavid period narrative. <clears throat> now, what about since then? Since then, I think things have begun to take off in a really very big way in the field of Shi'i studies, and I think, again, Safavid studies as well. <clears throat> so Shi'i studies since 2010-ish. Three major journals. This is a new one. Somebody sent me a, a note about this, so I posted something about that. Uh, this is uh, here out of the Islamic College, and this is uh, out of Princeton uh, from Brill, but it's basically being run by uh, Sabina Schmidtke and Hassan uh, Ansari. So you have two of these big, uh, three big journals, I think. You have, and here goes my uh, self-play for the others in the field, uh, lots of interesting going down in Shi studies at a place called Exeter, which I think is in England. Is that right? We, living in Scotland, you know, we're not too sure about coming down here. I only have a three-day visa, so we have to get an early train uh, back. Um, Birmingham, some recent hires, talking about contemporary Shiism, Shiism in Europe, Shiism in the diaspora, as it will, uh, both in the UK uh, and uh, in, in Europe uh, as well. And then uh, someplace up in Scotland, there's some people who are wandering around doing stuff uh, there as well. You also have a lot of Shi'i research and teaching NGOs across the world, but I'm just going to highlight these. The Ismaili Studies, Center for Islamic Shi'i Studies, Muhammad Trust, Center for Academic, all these people are Running conferences, sponsoring translations of books, there's a huge amount of material now out in English that wasn't around. My day, it was only Ian Howard's translation of Sheikh Mufid. It's out in their shop. Now you, whoa, you need like that much of a bookshelf to be able to hold on to this material. And conferences and goings on. And again, I refer back to the Institute of Ismaili Studies one from a couple of weeks ago, uh, just up in their new building up there, talking about what was going on there. And there is this conference. And again, if you're interested in Shiism, then you want to have taken some notice of that. If they were interested in Safavids, they would want to have taken some notice of that. And they didn't. They kind of went past each other, despite all these efforts and such. And my contention is, it's actually harder now to track the stuff, because there's so much more of it. There was an allusion that Rudy made, I think, to uh, this interested Persian and Iran and such like that. And of course. This is a very interesting uh, discussion that's going on um, today, the nature of impact and the understanding of Persian and Iranian. And here's Dabwa Shi's 2011 book, Religion, uh, sorry, Shi is in Religion of Protest versus John McHugo. Looking at the sectarianism, I think kind of adhering to it in McHugo, not himself an academic, and this is where I think we academics have not been successful in reaching out to people and saying, hey, these paradigms don't work. We have failed. And that's why I think impact is interesting. So it takes a non-academic, I think, to kind of make this point here, that actually there isn't this, as Obama himself said, a primordial thing between Shia and Sunni. I mean, the President of the United States says it. It must, it must be true. 
couldn't be fake news or anything like that. And Obama, in particular, himself making the speech uh, in the State of the Union address, then I think there was a big problem give credibility uh, given to that. But again, going back to the point about Persian versus Iran, Linda, uh, Linda Walbridge, John Walbridge's husband, and again, a chap called Reza Holom, who I'm not me, but I'd really like to meet him, talking about this sense, especially in the West, of how there's this unease with religion. And now you have a lot of money, in particular in the United States. Again, we talked about these things in the 70s. We don't talk so much about them now. But in the, seven, in the United States in the last, what, five, ten years or so, there's a, a massive interest in Achaemenians and Sasanians. At the undergraduate level, so much. This is part of an argument. It's part of a discourse. It's part of a dialogue. It's no different to what was going on when I studied Arabic and Persian at UCLA from Uncle Sugar. No different. It's a part of a discussion. I've got two more slides to go and then I'm out of here. Um, uh, three, I think it is, actually. Talking about uh, progress today, again, I put it, uh, talking about trade, talking about Figueroa's recent discussion. This came out. This is the Spanish ambassador to Shaw Foss in 2017. Wherein I think, again, you want to go back to look at Brentes and you want to go back and look at Quinn, neither of whose work show up in the very long index. A labor of love for that thing to come on, but again, a sense of we're going to take this at face value, where maybe I think you need to be an awful lot more careful. Then, especially because Charles is here, I want to thank the British Institute of Persian Studies for funding my subalterns conference, which is available uh, online, uh, that you can uh, access via my Sheedy News website, where you're kind of inverting the whole pyramid, getting away from the written text, and looking at the bottom up. Because that's what I think the chattering classes have missed. We're not looking at the bottom up. This is why I find Ali's paper so interesting. You're actually looking at this and, and interrogating real people. What did they really think? And there's a sense of possibly here in the UK or in Europe and the United States, if the chattering classes have been more engaged with that, we might not have had the kinds of surprises we've had in the last five years. And again, this is part of an idea to try and do the same thing uh, for the Safavids. Ferenc was there. Uh, Colin was there, so it was a really good, uh, uh, a really co good conference. Then I want to highlight the work of Atal and Zali. This whole notion of fixation with Mohammed Bakr and Bajla C. Uh, actually, I can say that at this Ismaili Studies Conference, I was mentioning this to, to Sajjad, who kind of corroborated. Somebody came out, a senior scholar, you can see the paper tonight, said, you know, I said to him, he was working on the Harvard War, and I said, you know, would you agree with me that Bajla C wasn't such a bad guy? And he said, yeah, Majesty wasn't such a bad guy. If you want to look at the person who's anti-Sufi and anti-Shi'i in particular, you really want to look at Tahir Qomi. He's the guy who really railed and ranted and raved about philosophy and Sufism, not Balkir Majlisi. This is an edition of the text, and this is Atta's uh, book. And bang. So in both senses, I think we're still kind of looking at Shi'ism and Sufism like this, but post-2010, we've broken free from those kinds of agendas. And again, the junior scholars here who are really, really well represented at this gathering, and also the junior scholars in Shiism who are really well represented at the Ismaili Studies gathering, are showing that that's the case. They're free of this kind of notion of these older paradigms, I think. And again, finally, I conclude, I'm looking forward very much to the next one, because while I think the Safavids have been extremely good to me, so much so that there's going to be another one of these I gather, I think really the challenge is going to become for the 18th century. How are we going to come and look at this? And here's Michael Axworthy's book, following off of a conference that was held at Exeter not so many years ago, beginning to say, look, this is going to be interesting. And that one I will most definitely come to, because I'd like to know kind of what's going on there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the um, so-called Ferengi Sazi paintings, which uh, literally means making the European manner. And these paintings are one of probably the remarkable outcomes of Yerusafa with mercantile and diplomatic exchanges. This new variant in Persian painting first appears under the reign of Shah Abbas II, who reigned between 1642 and 66, but established, uh, establishes itself under Shah Suleiman, who reigned between 1666 and 94. The topics of these paintings adopt a wide array of subject matter, ranging from traditional Iranian sense, including portraits of kings and nobles, to European portraits and landscapes, biblical or mythological sense. Ferengi Sazi paintings denote a syncretic style that blends Safavid artistic traditions with European pictorial techniques, such as watercolor or, or pointier, and with European iconographic adaptations. <clears throat> 
the examples of the famous Dutch prints and French engravings, uh, such as uh, Five Sins or Four Seasons, are especially visible in the works of Ali Ghali Jabadar and Muhammad Zaman, both active in the second half of the 17th century. However, we know little about the circulation of European objects in Isfahan's artistic milieu, and even less about the artistic interactions between the Persian and European artists. We may suppose, though, that these images reach Iran by way of European missionaries, ambassadors, merchants, artists, or simple travelers. The paintings associated with Ferengis' style are often annotated with the repetitive formulaic notes, which do indicate the date and name of artists, and sometimes the honorific title of patrons. These clues suggest that the paintings were mainly made for or under the patronage of a member of the royal court household or a king himself. European sources report the presence of various European items in the royal treasury or in the novel houses. Chardin, for instance, gives a vivid image of different Western treasures in one of the sections of Khazaneh, or the royal treasury, where the stores were filled with gold chains, precious boxes, bracelets, and other kinds of jewelry, weapons, mirror, clocks, etc. Surprisingly, however, there is almost no reference to these artworks and gifts in Persian contemporary chronicles. A rare Iranian record by Khatun Abadi um, around 1683, evokes that the king of Farang, that we do not know if it's France or England, sending to Shah Suleiman six books with exotic and strange images, or Ajib al How were these European objects received by the royal court? Iranian chronicles discussed this subject in broad terms, probably due to their general opinion of Europeans. Indeed, Safavid historic sources gave almost no importance to the Ferengis, as Rudy just told it. And I just repeat what Susan Babai um, reiterates, that until late in the 17th century, when some substantive written commentaries on Christians appear in Soviet sources, Europeans feature rarely, often in a passing and invariably with little or no commentary on the specifics of their character or social conduct. Concerning European arts, we may only perceive repetitive formulaic idioms such as Ahmashi Ferengi or uh, Western textiles among other varied diplomatic gifts from the Indian, Ottoman, and European envoys. Following the rituals of Safavid kings' receptions, European texts provide detailed accounts of the ceremonies in which the offerings were presented to the court and king. Raphael Dumont, for instance, mentions in his Etat de la Perse, written in 1660, that the court is not so much concerned about the diplomatic business as with the gifts, which are led before the king one after the other. He describes a long line of officers, tail to tail like messenger horses, each holding his item displayed on plain wood for more radiance. Kempfer, visiting in Iran in 1684, also confirms that uh, the presents brought by the envoys were shown in a long line. A chief of Yasovos, or the attendants, or vanguards, saw to it that the, report, uh, that the porters walked slowly and very stationed at the entrance of the hall, so that the king might look at the presents. Kempfer continues by remarking that, I quote, as the viewing took place uh, at a distance of 70 paces, it couldn't only be superficial, but I don't doubt the king, who very much appreciates presents, will have inspected them thoroughly later. In effect, Kempfer recalls that in Prince of the Ambassadors, the king indiscriminately dignified everything that was brought to him from afar with a friendly face. When they had been dismissed after the banquet, he examined with the greatest attention after having rejected the rest, the really, the really well-constructed things that he praised, but he set aside only those that were of gold or of precious metal and kept this himself. Raphael Juma also mentions this by describing how in the court the best accepted presents were silver coins, jewels, and pearls, since the Iranians considered other materials as trube katan or linen wood. The machines demonstrating a huge, uh, a high mechanical quality were, according to Kempfer, sent to Qal'e, or Castle of Tabarok. Uh, 
I believe that this castle, as well as other parts of the royal treasury, might be considered as the place Iranians, or at least some privileged elites, treated and observed European artworks. In other words, since we do not have the particular details of the instance of receipt, we may reflect on, reflect on the presence and influence of these objects among the Iranians in a larger context in order to see finally if, as Khatun Abadi stated, Iranians consider these objects simply as qaraib, or rather contemplated them, were inspired by them, and took advantage of their aesthetics and techniques. According to the Persian texts, such as the Chronicles or Tasker's biographies, or European travelers, all objects valor, whether Persian, European, Indian, or of any other foreign origin, given as a gift to the royal court, or considered as bounties, and all other important and unique treasures were conserved either in the Khazane royal treasury or in the Jebel Khane royal armory. According to Pedro Spedic, who visited Iran around 1674, Shah Soleiman's royal treasury had at least four sections, all supervised by eunuchs. The fourth one was the Jebel Khane, the royal arsenal, which contrary to the first three, was not located in the royal palace, but in the citadel of, citadel of the city of Isfahan, where it is enclosed in an immense palace. Chardin completes the picture by highlighting the fact that the Safavid court indeed had two Jebel Khane, the smallest one being located just beside the royal harem, and the greater one, the palace outside the city, is the same as castle, castle of Tabarok. Kempfer does not give more details, but mentions that military equipments, as well as all kind of object, objects, such as mirrors, paintings, telescopes, and all other similar items, were stored in Jebbehane, or arsenal, which is situated in the same castle of Tabarrok, or Qal'i Tabarrok. Chardin points out that this castle was more like a prison than a fortress, and one entered this dungeon only very rarely and by great favor, because the keys were held by three different persons, the governor of the palace, the vizier of Isfahan, and the person in charge of the smaller arsenal, or Jabadar. One must have all trees in order to be able to visit the palace. But contrary, contrary to Kempfer, who believed that nobody can either see or use the objects held here, Chardin visited the castle twice and gives a vivid account of its treasures, as he quotes, an infinity of clocks, all fine and curious, a large number of cabinets and tables, the most beautiful books and the finest materials of the universe brought from Germany, Italy, China, and all places. Chardin naturally seeks to know the value of these uh, treasures, and the great master in charge answered him that, nous avons le compte de chaque pièce, mais on ne soucie pas de savoir à, toi, à, tout, uh, à quoi le tout monte. Which means we have the account of each piece, but we do not really care about how much it all costs. Moreover, Chardin specifies that each piece bears a label showing the place from which it came, who offered it, the date of reception, and its value, except for pieces made in the king's workshops. According to Kempfer, the Etamot de Dole had an inventory of the gifts in order to be able to identify donors at the king's demand. Furthermore, he says that it is the task of Nazir and the chiefs of the royal workshops to make a precious estimate because for all the presents that are received by the court, the double in value is given in return as a present. So the written sources pinpoint the desire of Safavid kings for the golden or precious objects, but we may not be able to know more about the reception of European images at the royal court. This is rather intriguing since some late 17th century Farangi Sazi paintings reflect the European images. The use of shadings, cat shadows, and cast shadows and reciting perspective and a variety of subject matters render the so-called so Farangi Sazi works clearly distinguishable from Herat, Tabriz, or Isfahani styles of painting. But these paintings do not fully adhere neither to the pictorial conventions of European art. As Gary Schwartz remarks, in no particular instance do European travelers find common features between the art of their countries and of Persia. <laughs> 
Men and women richly dressed and coiffed are portrayed in elaborate settings in the vast open panoramas when the mountains or forests disappear into the distance under a pale blue sky. Although these mise-en-scene do not look entirely European, they would offer a new reading as regard the reception and perception in the Iranian court of European artworks. The main question in this regard is whether the artists and patrons who frequented the royal treasury and who were confronted by the European paintings style and techniques began to say their own cultural habits in a different way. In general terms, we could outline two groups of paintings in the Faring Sazi style. One includes the traditional Iranian themes, such as the royal gatherings, portraits of the kings among their loyal men, or even the illustrations added to ancient manuscripts, such as the, those added to Shahnameh started at the reign of Shah Abbas I. The second category is the paintings with the Occidental and non-Iranian subject matters, such as biblical scenes, portraits of European people, and Western mythology. The first group is seen in some folios of album E14 of the Russian Institute of Oriental Manuscripts, known as St. Petersburg Moraka. These represent the assemblies of Safavid kings, mostly Shah Soleiman, with their courtiers. This serious tendency is for developing new facial expressions and desire of documenting the course event are put alongside the traditional Persian treatment of people, animals, landscapes, etc. Non-dated, two, the, two of these paintings are signed Ali Ghali Jabadar, and two are highly attributed to him due to their several artistic similitudes and attitudes. Ali Ghali Jabadar, one of the major, major authors of the Farangis as a paintings, was probably working at Jabakhane if he was not himself its supervisor, since Jabadar signifies, signifies actually the keeper of armory. We know that this title was added to the artist's name during the reign of Shah Abbas II, he kept it during the reign of Suleiman, whilst also bearing royal, other royal titles. So could this focus on details of clothing, personalities, and features in a new and non-traditional way have been borrowed from the European imageries? Showing the kings and nobles, the St. Peter's with Morakia's folios illustrates the events that actually occurred in the Safavid court, such as giving an audience, hunting, selecting the best horses for the royal stable, etc. The reality of representation of Shah Soleiman and his courtiers, for instance, appears particularly in the re reliability of its many details in the historic sources. The scrupulous po positioning of Safavid courtiers, the permanent place of the king's most important, immediate, and influential interage when gathered in the audience, the corsi or the seat of the king as a small mattress with silver brocade and fine cotton wool, which is held in the two bottom corners with two large apples of solid gold, the wealth of dishes and people's clothes, to, say, to name some, are mentioned in every detail in Persian chronicles and European travelers, while describing the majlis e behesht ayin, or the paradisiac image of the assembly at the Shah Soliman's court. The Hezar Piché of the Mehdar, or the master of the royal wardrobe, is also brilliantly presented in the painting of the Shah, the Mehdar, and the young man. Literally, the Hezar Piché means thousand vocations, and it was a bag in which were kept the king's indispensable objects, such as handkerchief, um, toothbrush, nail clippers, and other essential items. According to Dasur al-Maluk, an early 18th century administrative manual, the Behtar Rekab a white eunuch, who permanently accompanied, uh, um, accompanied the king, always carried the Hezar Piché. Another example of recording the real might be also seen in the representation, presentation of the horses to the, kings, to the king in the presence of Amir al Khorbashi. Here we see a king under his golden parasol sitting on a chair looking at a herd of wild horses and probably listening to the indications of his Amir al Khorbashi, the master of stables, the third most important office in the Safavid administration. According to Al Ghawa Mawajib Dore Safaviye, another 18th century manual, and as artist, probably Ali Ghali Jabadar, features it clearly. Another officer of the royal stables, responsible for the new horses offered to the royal, royal court, or Amir al-Khurbashi Jolo, always carried a poniard attached to his belt as a specific signs of his function. 
These efforts of documenting real events possibly find some of its roots in various factors, including the European imageries, but also in the popularity of Mughal Indian paintings in Safavid Iran too. Moreover, during the 17th century, Reza Abbasi and his fellows presented many aspects of the, royal, the real social life in various single sheet paintings. Moin Mosavir, active between 1630 and 90, as the closest artist to Jabadar in terms of time, presents several factual events occurred during his lifetime, certainly with a totally different artistic approach, but with the same recording eye. So this recording the real would probably not be exclusively related to the study of European artifacts. We may not, however, underestimate a possible transmission of techniques and styles by this latter. Um, as such, the portrait of Mirza Jalala, signed by Ali Ghali Ghulamzadeh Qadim, son of a former servant, who should be equated with Ali Ghali Jabada, or the portrait of nobleman signed by Muhammad Sultani, could be considered as a sign of Iranian willingness to being identified with Europeans via an artistic technique which is itself inspired by the European images. The reception and perception of Euro European artifacts held in the royal treasury might be seen more comfortably in the second group of Farangi Sazi paintings. The European artistic influence is indeed most striking in paintings with Western subject matter such as, as I told, the Occidental mythology, biblical sense, or European people. However, upon a closer examination, the European models are, models are not faithfully copied here, with some profound modifications in details and semantic alterations. These paintings are depicted in an aesthetically Iranian amb ambience with a traditional Iranian treatment of color and space. The second group's paintings are mostly dated between 1673 and 89 and contain a considerable number of European women. For a period of 15 years, at least 13 paintings represent three different categories of Zane Farangi or European women. The biblical saints such as the Virgin Mary, Elizabeth and Judith, the individuals with Farangi fashion and European outfits, and finally, the bathers, or as I call them, Shirin, in the form of Venice and Susanna. It is highly probable that the patrons who commissioned these images had a semantic understanding of the European images. The artists, readers, or patrons of these paintings were probably neither the simple admirers of European works of art, nor passive toward Western cultural novelties. The emergence of the new subjects is effectively in a sort of selecting and choosing the imported images, probably in order to achieve a synthesis. In some cases, as Susanna or Venice, for example, we may perhaps be able to identify them as the new interpretation of Shirin taking a bath. Considering the postures of Susanna and Venice and neglecting their nakedness, we observe that these women share some points in common. The general poses of the characters are certainly identical to the European models, but the overall composition of the pictures and the backgrounds are all deeply modified. These women under a tree and next to a spring or a lake may remind us of Shirin taking her bath shown several times in Iranian paintings for centuries. It therefore seems important to ask the question whether there is a contagion of classical imagery of Shirin extending to the late 17th century paintings. In parallel, it should be also be considered as the acclimatization and its integration of Susanna and Venice into a new Iranian context. This idea is particularly supported by 18th or 19th century representations of Shirin. Some other Farangi women represented in Farangi Sazi paintings seem likely not necessarily to refer to a specific person, but rather to European people and their clothing uh, culture in general. Kemfer, for instance, reported the kidnapping of eight Farangi women in Isfahan neighborhoods in 1685. The reason given by the royal court was the desire of the harem's women to see the culture and clothes of the Farangi ladies. Some other paintings depict 
some unusual aspects of a strange and alien world, a Western environment where houses and landscapes are totally new and different from what was to be seen in Iran, where men and women wear attractive dresses and capes while behaving quite differently from what is known as being considered traditional and legitimate conduct between different sexes in 17th century Iran. These paintings reveal a new Iranian vision of the Western people, which was additionally recorded in written texts such as Safine Soleimani, or the Ship of Soleiman, one of the few Safavi travelers during Soleiman's reign. The author points out that it is another of the European roles that the degree of friendship one has for a person is ex expressed by the amount of affection one shows that person's wife. <laughs> So, to whom were addressed these paintings? Who commissioned the paintings in the Faring Sazi style in general? As the datings of signature testifies, the number of paintings with subjects related to the European culture and women increased notably in the second half of Suleiman's reign. This, I believe, is probably not a question of quantity of European works already in the royal treasury from at least the beginning of the 17th century, nor Iranian artists' access to them. It seems rather to reflect a change of context probably related to historical factors and not exclusively to artistic concerns. A change within the patronage itself. The most significant point about the so-called Farangi Sazi paintings is actually their lifespan. They were more prolific during the reign of Shah Soleiman than in the, reign, the reigns of Shah Abbas II and Shah Sultan Hussein, respectively. It is curious to note that the reign of Shah Soleiman witnessed a rivalry opposing the chancery, the equivalent of the high administration, and the royal household headed by the king's mother and senior eunuchs. According to Dastur al-Muluk, the Hajj's or eunuchs institution, especially the high-ranking eunuchs, including the treasurer, bypassed Sheikh Ali Khan, the Itamad al governors, emirs, and other men of the court in various state matters. Due to Suleiman's several seclusions, this complicity grew to the point of making some eunuchs indispensable, indispensable intermediaries between the sovereign and the outside world, and thus the true leaders of this state. Demonstrating the real facts, the subject matters of the first group of paintings may indicate the patronage to be either by the king or one of his immediate entourage. As such, we may suppose, uh, su suggest that the painting of the Shah, the Mehtar, and the young man has been made for the Mehtar, whose apartment, according to Dastur al-Muluk, was one of the confidential places at, uh, of the royal court. Likewise, the integration of the dress codes of the major figures of the royal stable raised the assumption of patronage from the noble family of Zangane, the same as the powerful Etamad de Dole of Shah Soleiman, who occupied the major positions of the royal stables from the reign of Shah Abbas I. It is interesting to note the distinguished place occupied by the two officers in the painting. They are both forming the vertices of a triangle, which the king occupies the third peak. Other novels, such as Mirza Muhammad Ali, Mirza Jalala, or Mirza Ali Ali, could also be considered as the patrons, since their names are mentioned in some page, uh, portrait paintings. On the other hand, Persian and European reading sources describe the creation of a hidden state with the royal harem. Composed of the queen mother, the principal annex, and the shah's favorite female consorts, the assembly of the Privy Council became the ultimate decision-making body and increased, f increased further the power and influence of women and eunuchs. So I wonder, and I ask the question, that if this Privy Council commissioned a representation of Judith, a biblical hero who played this decisive role in governing her country, the majority of biblical <coughs> illustrations in Iranian manuscripts often portrayed men, it is not only the new biblical characters who appear in the Faringi Sazi paintings, but the role they play is also apt to change. The Iranian traditional biblical illustrations concern the battle between good and evil, emphasizing the responsible role of prophets leading their people on the path of good. The biblical women of Faringi Sazi, however, do not represent this battle. The stories of Judith or Susanna are clearly far from the battles of prophets symbolizing the divine victory. <laughs>
the moral issue of Ferengisuzi paintings is rather secular, showing the bravery and loyalty of women. The formation of a private council in the harem with the queen mother as the head could favor female representations. Both the Iranian and European sources indicate the influence of the queen mother not only on the king, but on diverse state matters. Could this explain the raison d'etre of three representations of the Virgin Mary? Eventually, it is interesting to note that the queen mother actually visited the castle of Tabarok at least once. Shah Suleiman ordered the Qoroq, or reservation, exclusively for his mother, who, without participation of other women from the Sarailo, wished to visit the castle of Isfahan and its treasures. So finally, as my conclusion, because I really respect it 30 minutes, dating from the second part of the 17th century, the so-called Ferengisazi paintings adopt a new pictorial language, most likely by observing European works of art. This ladder was stored in the Jebakhane, the armory situated in the Tabaru castle, as one of the four sections of the royal treasury. By rely relying on the foreign object d'art, the late 17th Safavid selectively chose and adapted the most striking and fascinating aspects of the Western world, mixing them more often with their own taste, aesthetics, and techniques, and created a new genre in Iranian painting. The so-called Ferengisazi paintings are not numerous, and the number of artists barely exceeds five. The patrons of these works, I believe, are as few as the number of works and artists, limited to some very influential person in the court and the king's household. The Safavid courtiers and nobles, who often occupied royal functions for se several generations, or in the case of eunuchs and women, those who had the most significant position in Shah Suleiman's household and diplomatic rank. Addressing a new audience, the Ferengisazi paintings may be considered as a singular reading precisely tailored to the personality and the social position of their patrons. Ultimately, the Occidentalist characters of some late 17th century Iranian painting is borne by the presence of European cultural elements, not in an exhaustive or scientific way, but rather in order to capture some poignant traits and fantasies. These paintings altered, I think, our idea of Iran in the late Safavid period by providing a window into, into the Iranian perception of the West in the second half of the 17th century, and also by taking advantage of the social and political messages conveyed by the foreign imagery, those who served the purpose for Iranian patrons and their local interlocutors. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>